uh, less than ideal setup, but still we hope we, we, we were able to at least create the conditions for some uh, uh, fruitful discussions to happen. Um, this is uh, a very interesting day that we have uh, ahead of us uh, with two uh, very exciting uh, sessions that were put together by, by uh, colleagues that uh, did a great job. Uh, and as I mentioned in my uh, introductory uh, speech on the first day, uh, the, the session chairs together with the reviewers uh, really are a very fundamental part of UCOMS and, and the key to the success of, uh, of this conference. Uh, I would like to uh, once again underline and, uh, and uh, remind everyone that our objective is to discuss ideas. So I, I would like to ask the, the presenters to, to leave enough time uh, for that to happen during their slots. Our original guideline was 10 plus 10 minutes. We understand that keeping it 10 minutes may be difficult, but uh, uh, little effort perhaps will pay off in, uh, in, uh, for the whole community to, uh, to engage in more uh, fruitful discussions. Uh, another thing I would like to remind everyone, please uh, keep a look at your uh, microphones. Remain, they should remain muted. Uh, the, 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 um, the cameras, I, I'm happy with cameras turned on. I think it's not a big issue on, on bandwidth, bandwidth and at least we try to maintain a little bit of a of a human touch in this uh, in this virtual conference. Um, oh, what else I have for you? Uh, I would like to remind again that we will be uh, streaming on YouTube. The idea is more than anything to allow for replay for the people that were not able uh, to connect live. Uh, if you have any of the authors have any issue with this, please just let us know and we interrupt the stream during, during your talk. Uh, the first session of the day uh, is uh, is called Next Generation Adaptive Modem Architectures and Cognitive uh, Networking Strategies. It was put together and curated by our two good colleagues at TNO, Henry Dahl and Kuhn Bloom. And uh, I will not hold you anymore. I think I would pass the floor to them to, to conduct uh, this, uh, this interesting uh, uh, session. So over to you guys. Thank you, Joao. Yes, uh, let's not uh, spend too much time on uh... Uh, the non-technical talking.
communicate with a uh, modem that is deployed, deployed from a ship, uh, which we are calling uh, the main receiver node here. Uh, AUV transmits a frame. Uh, it is received on the main receiver node. Uh, it is successful if the main receiver node can uh, decode the packet successfully and the user can consume it. Uh, however, that does not happen always. Uh, the link could have poor connectivity because of which many a times you can see that the uh, frame is not decoded correctly. So if you have another spare modem on the ship, which you can deploy it from other end of the ship, and somehow if they could act as a combined receiver, uh, which can cooperate over a short range <coughs> network, such as over example, ethernet or Wi-Fi LAN, uh, would that help? Of course, yes, because spatial diversity is known to improve the communication uh, performance. But the question that we are asking really is what are some of the practical challenges that uh, we see in developing such a capability and how easy is it to implement such a capability? Well, what are the advantages of such a capability? Uh, you can use your available assets uh, opportunistically. Uh, you can also achieve much larger diversity because you can have larger spatial, com uh, spatial separation between the devices as compared to uh, if you uh, just had uh, multiple hydrophones on a single modem. So, um, but you may not just have two nodes, uh, 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 two receiver nodes. You may, you can generalize this to having multiple receiving nodes which are cooperating over a short range network. So in general, you have one transmitter which is trying to communicate with the main receiver over a long range virus link. For example, an underwater acoustic link and uh, these assisting receivers and the main receivers are cooperating over a short range network, for example, over Ethernet or Wi-Fi LAN. Now, let's look at some of the practical challenges that we see. So the first one is associating the correct signal. So what I mean by association over here is that we should be able to pick up the correct signals at the main receiver node in order to combine them. So uh, I will give an example here uh, where uh, this is a problem, that this is a tricky situation. So you can see here that you have two mobile nodes, uh, AUV1 and AUV2. They are almost equidistant from uh, the ship and uh, uh, both the packets from, a, a, one packet from AUV1 and the packet from AUV2 is received at the main receiver node, but it is also received at the assisting receiver node and which is forwarded to the main receiver node. So now, out of the four packets, the main receiver nodes needs to pick up the two, two packets which are uh, which needs to be combined for AUV1 and which needs to be combined for AUV2. And all of this happens almost at the same time. So you need to make sure that you are associating the correct signals before you combine them. So that's one problem. The second problem, uh, and because of this problem, you need to make sure in your solution that the probability of incorrect association is actually minimized. The second problem is uh, due to the delays uh, that you see. So if you have a distance D1, D2, and the difference between them is, uh, let's say, 100 meters, you would say about 66 milliseconds. So at main receiver node, you would receive uh, the direct packet and the one that is coming from the existing receiver node within 66 milliseconds. Although uh, you may not have these uh, receiver nodes on the ship, uh, they can be actually quite far apart. They could be connected over the internet, uh, for example, in a localization kind of an application. And here you can see that D1, D2, the difference between that is 100, 1000 meters and uh, the delay could be about 600 milliseconds. So uh, the point here is that the, uh, the, the time range within which these packets come in, which we need to associate, uh, could vary from tens of milliseconds to about thousands of, uh, or about uh, hundreds of milliseconds. So we should we should make sure in our solution that the probability of missed association is also minimized. Now, just to summarize, uh, what are the practical problems for realizing uh, this system? So the first one is the need for associating the correct signals before combining, which may be due to the long propagation delays or undesired transmitters, also because of the strong scatterers uh, where you could, uh, you could receive a reflection which you don't want to combine. And the second one is time synchronization for accurate association because the receiver nodes are not time synchronized. So you need to make sure that the synchronization information is updated uh, regularly. 
So let's dive into the uh, details of how the association of signals happen before the combining. So let's look at the timeline of the main receiver, uh, nearest assisting receiver from the transmitter and fur furthest assisting receiver from the transmitter. So the preamble is detected first on the nearest assisting receiver uh, that is denoted by Rx start message over here. This Rx start message also contains the time at which this preamble was detected. Now this gets forwarded uh, over the short range network to the main receiver. We call it Rx start copy because it is just copy of that message. Uh, next, the preamble is detected on the main receiver itself. And then a preamble is detected on the furthest assisting receiver, which is again forwarded to the main receiver. Now you have detected the preambles, the signal is captured. And after some processing time on each of these devices, you would get a, a message which says whether it was successfully decoded or whether it was a failure. So in this illustration, I'm showing that Rx end failure means that the packet was captured. It tried to decode it, but it did not uh, decode it successfully. So we got a Rx end failure message. And this Rx end failure also contains information such as log, likely, like, log likelihood ratio of the bits it was trying to decode. Now that also gets forwarded over the short range network to the main receiver. You again receive a Rx end failure, let's say on the main receiver, and you may receive a Rx end failure on the nearest assisting receiver. And now all of this information is available on the main receiver. Although you could see that the order is reversed here. And the point of this illustration was that this order may depend on the processing time. And therefore, we cannot use uh, these messages for association. Instead, what we use is these messages, which are the preamble detections for the association. So that is what we do. So we define a window uh, at uh, around uh, the time at which we detected the preamble on the main receiver. And that uh, time window is dependent upon the distance between the main receiver and the furthest, receiving, uh, furthest assisting receiver. And of course, for all of these to happen, that is these time comparisons to happen, we need to make sure that these uh, the assisting receivers and the main receiver are time synchronized. And therefore, we need to update the synchronization information depending on that, that update interval could depend upon the clock accuracy. Now, uh, getting a little bit into the implementation details, there are only four scenarios that we need to make sure when we implement uh, this logic in our uh, in, in in our system. So the first four first three scenarios are scenarios in which the at least one of the main receiver or the assisting receiver received the frame successfully. Now, when you receive a frame successfully. Uh, selection diversity is at play, uh, it, can, it can publish it and the user can consume the data. The only scenario in which we need to do diversity combining is when you have a view, uh, the main receiver tried to decode it and it failed and none of the assisting receivers were able to decode the packet successfully. And in this case, only we do the diversity combining. So now let's look at how the flow of messages or the flow of data happen when we do a diversity combining. So let's go back to the first example that I started with. So we have an AUV which is trying to communicate with the main receiver node. Now let's look at how the data flows. The data comes into the data link layer. It requests the physical agent to transmit a frame. Transmit uh, UV transmits the frame. It goes through water. It is received at the physical agent at both main receiver node and the assisting receiver node. Uh, the uh, preamble is detected. Um, in this case, uh, both of them were unable to decode it successfully. So you get an Rx end failure. Now the diversity agent at the assisting receiver node receives both of these messages and forwards these messages. That is the copy of these messages to the diversity agent on the main receiver node over the ethernet or Wi-Fi LAN, which is the short range network. And then on the uh, diversity agent on the main receiver, combines all of this information that it has from the Rx and failure and Rx and failure copy and sends out a decode request to the physical agent, which then probably improves the odds of decoding the packet and sends out a Rx frame if it decodes it to the data link and the user to consume. So the point here is that the most of the infrastructure that you we see here was already available in the software that we were using, which was unit stack. The only addition that we had to do was to implement the diversity agent here, which could take care of the association, uh, the diversity combining and the time synchronization. Now, 
coming to the combining technique, the combining technique that we used was uh, like log likelihood ratio combining, wherein the LLRs of each encoded bit are extracted from each of the receiver node and then they are combined. So the transmitted symbol, uh, the ith transmitted symbol is denoted by xi here and the j and it is received on a jth assisting receiver and that is denoted by yij so uh, there is nothing new here but uh, this is just the definition of uh, llr and uh, to estimate the llr uh, uh, llr of the ith transmitted symbol we um, sum over all of the assisting receivers and uh, get an estimate now coming to the experimental setup, we went out to the Singapore Marina here, where we had one transmitter, uh, one main receiver and one assisting receiver, which were 25 meters apart, about 270 meters, uh, 275 meters from the transmitter. And they were actually wired over ethernet uh, to cooperate uh, between the receiver nodes. Um, for hardware, we were using Subnero modems running unit stack. And for software, we were using unit stack, which were which was providing equivalent concepts that I uh, described earlier. That is, bad frame notifications for carrying uh, information uh, about LLRs and FEC decode request for sending out the um, combined information back to the stack for decoding, and also wormholes, uh, which provide an easy way for us to cooperate between the receiver nodes. So we had uh, we used both FHBFSK and OFTM uh, with BPSK. Uh, at each test, we uh, transmitted 100 frames uh, at a particular code rate, and we used LDPC codes with different code rates in different uh, test scenarios. And uh, the cooperation was over a wired Ethernet for this uh, particular testing. So let's look at results. Um, for the FHBFSK scheme, so let's uh, so this uh, pink color here is the percentage of packets that were directly received by the main receiver. That is. Uh, uh, it directly received. The blue one is percentage of packets that received via selection diversity, and the gray are the ones uh, are the percentage of packets uh, that are received via combining diversity. Now, if you look at uh, this plot on x-axis here, uh, without diversity at one third code rate, you can see that none of the packets were actually getting detected. And same when you when it was half code rate and if, when it was uncoded, of course there was uh, no uh, there was no packets that were getting decoded uh, uh, received successfully without diversity. But with diversity, you can see that at one third code rate, most of the packets came through the assisting receiver. Uh, that is, almost all of the packets came through the assisting receiver. When the uh, when it was half code rate, that was the data rate was a bit higher. The uh, assisting receiver was able to decode some of it, but some of it uh, came through by diversity combining. And when it was uncoded, that was data rate was even higher. You can see that most of the packets actually came through the diversity combining. And here we can see the advantage of actually. Uh, using both se selection diversity as well as diversity combining when we when we were uh, when we do this kind of a solution. So there are uh, more uh, results in the paper about OFDM uh, performance as well. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just uh, present this one and uh, that you can read. Uh, uh, in conclusions, I will just leave you with these key takeaways. Uh, uh, the first one is that uh, with this capability, you can use available modems opportunistically and take advantage. Uh, you can get much larger separation between the receivers. Uh, that is possible. Association of the correct signals to combine is a critical problem uh, in practice, and that is what we need to uh, resolve to get this correctly. Uh, we saw that combination of selection diversity and diversity com combining was very advantageous. And of course, the software defined nature of uh, unit stack actually allowed us to develop this capability with very ease. Uh, possible extension of this work is to cooperate over high speed acoustic as well as optical links. Uh, and finally, the objective of this uh, was for us to overcome all these practical issues and provide a capability for utilizing distributed spatial diversity. And uh, uh, this is actually already implemented now in unit stack and is available under the brand Unity by Subnero. Uh, so if someone is interested, uh, they can visit the website to find out more information about this and more resources about this. So with that, I would like to thank you and uh, uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Pasad. It's very, very interesting presentation. And uh, yes, given the, the uh, challenge of the association, I. Uh, I'm very uh, 
interested also to hear that it's already available uh, on your yep. modems. Uh, so if anybody has uh, specific questions concerning this talk, then please uh, let us know. Uh, in in the um, presentation in the paper you uh, you presented uh, the connection between the the different uh, receivers is by wire, right? That's right. Yeah. So and yeah, you also mentioned some possibilities to have uh, another modality, maybe an optical. Yeah. So uh, in fact, yeah. you could have mm -hmm. a, a optical as well as high speed acoustic link. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, the frameworks can support any type of link, but uh, of course it will need a little bit of different configuration because it will affect delays mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you need. So, and, but that is a configurable parameter that one can uh, set in order to use that. But yes, in, in, you can actually use different modalities uh, for the short range network. Any more questions? Otherwise, maybe you can tell a little bit more about uh, how you're going to tackle the association problem. Uh, so the association problem is something that we already tackled uh, in uh, okay. this uh, work. Um, so we were actually um, uh, sharing uh, the information from the uh, from all the assisting receivers and receiving it on the main receiver, and we were trying to combine it. Uh, but you you need some kind of uh, ID. Uh, well, you could not demodelize. Come again? You need some kind of uh, identifier from the header, while well, you cannot demodelate the signal. But... Uh, yes, of course. So uh, we do uh, uh, make use of the time information that is uh -huh. available when the uh, preambles are detected on uh, on the uh, on each okay. of the receivers, mm -hmm. and then that time information is what is being shared, and that is what is used. And in addition to that, you also have information such as where is this uh, packet coming from, uh, because uh, when the packet is decoded, so actually the packet is decoded, and at the uh, and the information is available on the uh, uh, messages that ha that come in after the decode decoding on where this message is coming from. So that information is also utilized in the association part to figure out where this message is coming from. Okay, they should not be too far apart then, I guess, the notes to keep uh, in the actually, same window. Yeah, yeah so uh, all you need to make sure is that your uh, time association window is yeah. such that uh, yeah. it can have all the uh, arrivals within that window. Okay, thank you very much. I think it's time to uh, to go to the next speaker. And Kuhn, will you uh, announce? Yes, yes. One? Thanks, thanks, Prasad. Um, so the next speaker that will be Elias Erstorp from uh, Key, Key TH in Sweden, and he will talk about adaptive power control for flooding-based underwater networks, network protocols. So, Elias, the floor is yours. Yes, can you see my screen here? Yes, it's Perfect. very clear. Yeah. Thank you for a good presentation, Prasad. Uh, it's good to see a familiar face here. Um, this presentation will also include a little bit of some neuro modems, uh, which we have purchased from them. So since I'm a new face in this forum, I would like a sh to have a short introduction. I'm a PhD student in the Swedish Maritime Robotic Center, um, which started in 2017. And in SMARC, we are developing a couple of autonomous underwater vehicles, uh, a big one, which you see here, and a smaller one. Um, the big one we are uh, is still under development, of course, but what? Oh. Yeah, so it's under development and we are at a point where we want to do longer missions with this and uh, we want to, because of that, we want to be able to remove the operators and not being necessary to have a following boat nearby all the time. So we have uh, 
got a bunch of subneural modems from uh, Singapore, which we want to use to be able to keep a uh, near real time communication with the with the submarine or the AUV while it's operating. And my job is to do the networking part for for these modems. So for these modems, we need some uh, networking protocol, and we have uh, arrived at using a flooding-based protocol, and this is because of the operational scenarios we envision. Uh, when we are operating this vehicle, it, it will be in different environments, and the net, the, the, we will have a very dynamic setting. And because flooding-based routing protocols are not at least in their simpler form, not topology reliant. They are suitable for these dynamic settings. And they are also very, they have good ad hoc capabilities and are sort of scalable. Um, so we have decided as a routing protocol to use a specific one that was introduced by Otnes and Havik, that is our colleagues at FFI in Norway, introduced in 2013. Uh, this is a protocol that has been validated through simulations and C trials. Uh, it is based, it, it uses a counter based scheme with an adapt, adaptive backoff to limit the number of retransmissions in the network. Um, and uh, our what we we want to use this uh, because it's quite straightforward in its implementation. We could move this onto these modems quite easily. Um, yeah, and what we want to do to be able to keep this network going alive for as long as possible, we seek to re lower the energy consumption. And we want to do this with a, with an add-on protocol that we call D-Power. So the protocol we have tried in this article um, it's, it's the goal is to keep it in parallel, sort of working independently of the flooding protocol. Um, so the flood will be on on top of it, but and use with the power to send messages. The power will uh, in real time or on the fly set. Uh, the power power level of the modem as it is retransmitting a message. Um, what we have done is a quite straightforward uh, strategy for doing this. Um, so if we imagine this network here, we we let modems uh, send select a power level that in such a way that a number of neighbors when it is going to receive the message that is being sent. Uh, and in order to do this, modems in the networks has to pairwise power calibrate. And this we also do in a quite straightforward manner. As, as messages are being disseminated over through the network, uh, nodes in the network detects their one hop neighbors and schedules a calibration, a power calibration. And this calibration is then uh, simply going, it, it, it's a sequence of ping pong packets that is being exchanged by two modems from beginning at, at the highest modem power and gradually reducing it until it's a power level that seems suitable for that link 
is selected by each modem. And when messages are being forwarded, here we used a number of neighbors of three um, by, by the modems when forwarding messages. Uh, yes. So our simulated scenario looks like this. We have node number one here that is uh, down to, to the left corner. That is trans is the source. And we have node number 16 in the opposite corner, which is the sink. And we are simulating a transmission of 500 data packages. And we look at the uh, um, energy consumption and pa packet delivery ratio with this simple setup. And yeah. So every link has been power calibrated and as, as a node re forwards a message, it selects a power level such that at, at least three neighbors are likely to receive the message. And it, without the power, a, we get a a trans this is showing the 500 package how how they are being forwarded over the network without the power and we with the power we see a sparsification effect which is uh, quite um, expected so to say um And looking at the energy consumption, we, we do this for 10 network realizations. So it's sort of a semi qualitative study. Um, yeah, I forgot to mention that we, we do this network for 10 different realizations where the nodes has been randomly placed in this grid, one node in each in each square of the grid. And for 10 network realizations, we do these 500 packets transmission uh, and simulate the result. Uh, simulations one to 10 here is without the power and 11 to 20 is with the power. And we can here see that there is a significant reduction in in the energy consumption for a majority of the nodes. And looking at the packet delivery ratio, we expectedly also see that we lose more packets using the power. Um, so the the drop is from 90, 95% to 70 to 80% delivery rate. We have one realization here, simulation number 13, where we get a pretty drastic drop, which is due to um, cluster formation. So you get a bunch of nodes that are close to each other and they they uh, calibrate their power levels to a low level and then forwards the messages among themselves. We have some solution to this that we want to look at in the future. So with this quite straightforward procedure or, or protocol, we see a significant saving in energy um with a hopefully acceptable packet error loss in or packet error rate uh, that is acceptable 
and our next step will be to do field testing of this. Then there's also some questions we want to look at in the future, like when to perform recalibrations of the links in more sophisticated uh, power calibration uh, strategies. Um, we also want to look at other uh, par par combination of parameters, both of D flood and D power, because we think that we can both reduce the energy consumption and improve the uh, packet delivery rate. And we also want to look at solutions to the clustering problems and then a little bit further into the future, see if we can have some uh, quality of service uh, for flooding protocols. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot, Elias, for the, for the clear talk. Are there any questions? Oh, there is a question. I see a question from Roberto. Um, do you? Yeah, I, so, I, can you hear yeah. me? I can ask the question. Uh, yeah, 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 I can. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I was wondering, and I think this is partially covered by your last slide about the recalibration. So for the results you showed, the network setup and calibration was done at the beginning uh, of the uh, of the the simulation, and then you assume that everything is stationary for the for the for the rest. You are not doing any uh, calibration along the way. That was the first question, and the the second one is about uh, um, when you do calibration or eventually calibration. Uh, you you may have the impact of other nodes transmissions that may interfere, and so they they may uh, make you guess. Uh, eventually, you know, in uh, calibration uh, being performed not in the optimal way, how you tackle this? Yeah, so that's true. Um, in this work, we for the simulation result, we, we perform the calibration before we actually send all these 500 packets in order for calibration, transmissions required for calibration, not to intervene with the, with the statistics. Um, the nodes are static in this case. That is also true. And uh, what was the first? Um, yeah, we, we we don't allow more than uh, so. So there are some rules for the calibration to avoid uh, several calibrations in a sort of one hop neighborhood to be performed simultaneously. If that was if that answers your question. So we try to avoid to do a calibrations while there's a lot of communication ongoing. Okay, I, I guess those are all uh, problems or issues that you need to tackle and relax when, when you when you are in a, a real life scenario and uh, where you have dynamics uh, involved. Yeah, exactly. So one uh, one question or the last question sort of refers to that when to do perform recalibrations um, may, maybe uh, should it be at that time interval should we try tracking the background noise or test the links at some intervals okay i yeah. just one uh, one comment uh, since you are now going to address recalibration and eventually you are you need to collect some information from the network at runtime and eventually update what is the uh, the knowledge of each node to to properly tune uh, power at that point you can also collect more information and uh, the you can relax the fix uh, you know three neighbors to something that it can be more ad hoc so lower or more depending on the on the network topology and also can uh, try to avoid uh, duplicate packets being relayed in areas of the network that are not of interest. So and just as a comment, once you start working on feedbacks from the from the receiver, the, there is a new dimension that you can explore there to optimize the performance of your uh, protocol. Mm. Thank you for the, your comment. Yeah, so that's a good comment. Yeah, I also had a question related to the calibration. It's partly answered i think but in case you do the initial calibration um, and you overhear another calibration will there then be a random back of time 
uh, before you do a new calibration. It wasn't mentioned in your paper, but I can imagine you do something like that. Yeah, exactly. So if if a scheduled calibration is about to start and, and another calibration is already ongoing, it will there will be a random back off. Back off. That's true. Okay. Okay. Thanks. And I see, it, there's it, also it, a question. We'll continue to do that up to a certain number yeah. of times. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's that's clear. Uh, I see another question from Roel. Yes, uh, I'm glad to see Dflot being used. Uh, but I was wondering, have you made any changes to the regular Dflot rules, or is this regular Dflot with the po uh, power control uh, calibration added on top? Yeah, it is the regular Dflot. We tried to to stick as closely, or, or the rules should be exactly the same, and the even the parameters are the same. Not to, okay. yeah, uh, to be consistent. Okay. But there, there is uh, in one of the articles on Dflood a capability for or or an option for for retransmitting that we haven't implemented. And uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Many thanks, uh, Elias, for your uh, presentation and your uh, clear answers uh, on the questions. So, so next will be my uh, colleague, uh, Henry Dole. And uh, Henry will talk about challenges of underwater acoustic communication at short ranges. So Henry, the floor is yours. Thanks, Koen. Uh, I have to surprise I got two more minutes. So I'll just quickly start up my presentation. Okay. I hope you see it. Yes. Yeah, we could wait two more minutes if you if you want to really stick to the schedule. Well, just to make sure that there's no more questions from the, the previous presenter. Yes. I'm checking it right now. I can add, I can add a comment uh, instead of writing it. Um, if you do include the retransmissions, that may include reduce the gap you had between the packet delivery ratio. Uh, with and without the power control. But of course, the cost is as you use more power, so but it might be worth investigating. Yes, you're you're right about that. And yeah, the, the flood because of this, the with, with the rules in the flood, I think with the power, if we actually increase the number of neighbors that are likely to receive a message <clears throat> the, the constraining rules of the flood will be more active because yeah. more nodes will overhear than you so so there will be a balance between there there might be an op optimal value of the number of neighbors to receive a message where where the flood is actually more active yeah if that made sense Thank you. Okay, well, in case uh, no more questions, I, uh, I just start with the next talk, which is mine. Um, okay, I'm going to tell uh, about uh, 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 communication performance uh, at, uh, at short ranges and uh, at stationary conditions, which sounds uh, quite easy, but it's not always like that. So. Um, so could yeah, you open it full screen, Henry, maybe then it's better to read. Oh, I did. Mm. It's not. Uh, I think you have it on the wrong uh, window. OK. I replace it. It's correct now. Nothing yet. And then I decouple the big screen. Yeah, 
No, it, it's fine, uh, Henry. Yes. So, Henry, the floor is yours. Okay, so I could have used the extra minutes. Um, anyway, uh, in our uh, daily practice uh, with uh, Navy and uh, uh, commercial uh, customers, we uh, often hear uh, statements like uh, that communication performance uh, uh, decreases with increasing range and that it decreases with increasing Doppler speed. Of course, there is uh, truth in that. Uh, for example, if you see, look at the graph from the, the well-known paper by Kilfoyle and Bagarur from 2000, a similar picture was also included by uh, Dr. Shimura uh, before. So often it's the case, but uh, I think the exceptions make the rule. There are lots of exceptions, and uh, that's what I want to uh, uh, lay the focus a little bit on in this uh, presentation. Um, Okay, the, all the results that I will show um, are for uh, uh, an, a modulation called multi-stream uh, frequency repetition spread spectrum, uh, abbreviated to MSFRSS, and uh, it's uh, uh, based on FRSS uh, by uh, Paul van Walrey. Uh, in FRSS, original FRSS, um, we have uh, multiple redundant subbands uh, which are fed to a multi-channel or multi-band uh, equalizer. Well, in MSFRSS, uh, not all the bands are redundant. Uh, we define streams uh, in which the bands are subbands are redundant, but the different streams are not. And then the, all of the subbands are being randomized. And by differentiating the, the number of subbands uh, in the streams and the modulation types in I, 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 don't, I cannot see you right now. I think your connection dropped. No sound. And no sound also. Yeah. So Henry is checking his uh, setup. Kuhn, are you taking his bandwidth? <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I, I think. Uh, and, and we, <laughs> no, actually, we're cabled. We have cabled connections now. So. It, uh, yeah, the problem is if I disconnect my screens, then I'm not longer on. No. No. So Henry's restarting his Webex. Uh He's uh, restarting his Webex uh, login now. Hopefully that will help. Okay. Um. So where were, did I go? Oh. 
Okay, so we use a modulation high bandwidth uh, modulation uh, frequency band uh, of about 30 uh, kilohertz or uh, 20 kilohertz for the AUV. And um, the first case that I want to uh, consider is uh, a test we did in, uh, in inland uh, water. And in the picture you clearly see that the water is actually higher than the land, which is often the case in the Netherlands. And um, we, in this case, we were able to uh, achieve uh, a data rate uh, of uh, about 10 kilobit per second over uh, seven kilometers. And um, eventually the connection was uh, lost uh, due to um, the river bending. And uh, the reason for the, this large distance uh, that we could achieve was partly the, the fresh water, so a little absorption and uh, the muddy bottom bottom that uh, cancelled uh, the, the multipaths uh, for the longer distances. So actually the performance became better for, mm. for the longer distances. Uh, of course, this is not always the case, but there are often uh, uh, farms where you have this uh, mode stripping effect. Okay, another uh, uh, case uh, on the contrary was uh, uh, where we had very uh, uh, short distance communication in the harbor. And then there was so much uh, uh, reverberation, uh, scattering uh, reflections that uh, if you look at uh, the impulse response that is shown is on this slide, uh, it looks like a deep water scenario. And that is because the second cluster of arrivals is actually a horizontal multipod from uh, another K. Um, so that was, of course, very interesting, but uh, this was not really uh, useful because the communication did not work in uh, in this case. For this Sorry to bother you, uh, but I think uh, you're, you're displaying the wrong screen. I'm seeing the, the the speaker screen, not the display screen. Yeah, that's correct. Because if I disconnect my big screen, then uh, I, lo I lose my connection. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, Henry, have you con tried there in, in, in that window where you have display settings and that drop down box? Display okay. settings is switch, switch or swap. Swap, okay. the first one. Uh, have you tried that? Yeah, I, try, I do it now. Yeah, now it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not really used to WebEx. I usually use uh, another program. But, um, no worries, all good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So, um, and yet another case. Uh, we did the communication experiments in the, at the North Sea, and uh, that was communication between a, a stationary a ship node and a bottom node. So you would say uh, easy, uh, but uh, the, the the ship was rolling on the waves, and uh, we had uh, the 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 modem was the transmitter was not not really uh, well damped. Uh, so we uh, although we had a small Doppler shift, we had a large Doppler spread and. Uh, yeah, as you see in the pictures uh, on, the, on the top right, uh, this was quite a challenging uh, channel and uh, we had some very hard uh, times in uh, demodulating uh, the signals. Well, when we did the same experiment before in uh, the Trondheim fjord, uh, where there was uh, no waves at all at that time, and then we had quite good uh, communication, which is shown by the animation, if visible with a speed up of about uh, factor uh, four. Um, that uh, images uh, uh, came in by the low quality of service uh, parts uh, regularly. Some of them had bit errors like this one. Uh, but uh, in the high quality of service uh, parts, positions uh, uh, were um, just have my, f I'll try to have a pointer, but anyway. Uh, the positions were always coming uh, through correctly. So the success of the, the communication was really dependent on the on the Doppler spreads. And then there is the, the case that is uh, described in the in the paper, uh, where we had a uh, communication between an AUV at speed. So a maximum sp speed of our AUV is about four knots. Can even do five, but uh, four is uh, usual uh, speed. And a bottom node. And although uh, in this case there is uh, a Doppler uh, shift uh, in, in, the, in the channel, it's uh, quite constant and uh, the Doppler spread was, uh, was reasonable and we had quite good uh, uh, communication. Uh, it's interesting to see that uh, at a short distance, 
when the maneuvers of the AOV are more influential, the, the channel is more challenging than uh, at uh, the large distance. So actually the, the communication performance at uh, large, well, in this case large, 700 meters, uh, was much better than uh, at uh, 100 meters. So this is also an example of the, uh, that can be, it can go the other way around. Um, yeah, my colleague uh, Mark Pryor had uh, uh, some thoughts about it and uh, he uh, wrote down some, some theory about it and he, uh, uh, his uh, reasoning was that uh, actually the, the vertical uh, motion of the, uh, of the transmitter or receiver is much more influential than the, the horizontal uh, motion. And because if you have uh, reasonably large distances, then the, 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 uh, the ray angles theta, which are uh, with respect to the horizontal, uh, are quite uh, small and then you can make this kind of uh, um, Approximations of the, the relation of uh, between the frequency spread and the, and the angular spread, and then um, in the in the first case uh, we have a pure uh, horizontal uh, velocity, and in the second case pure vertical velocity. And then you see in the, on the picture on the right side that the sensitivity to the vertical velocity is an order of magnitude higher than uh, than sensitivity to the, uh, the horizontal velocity. So that uh, we also uh, saw that in practice quite recently, only a few weeks ago during the Ocean 2020 uh, 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 trial in the Baltic Sea, there we had a uh, uh, transducer uh, streamed behind a rib and because of the strong current uh, it was uh, uh, almost uh, at a, a very uh, big, uh, well small angle in the water, so almost horizontal and then it was uh, oscillating and we had quite some uh, some oscillations on the signal and uh, quite a lot a large uh, uh, Doppler spread. And if you uh, remove this Doppler spread by correcting for the for the phase of the of the main arrival, then you see that it um, actually disappears and you get a much much easier channel. So the, uh, the Doppler spread is very uh, influential for these uh, uh, high rate high bandwidth uh, communications. Okay. I don't know how far I am in my time because uh, of the, the problems with, uh, with the presentation, but I uh, am already at the concluding uh, remarks. And that is that uh, underwater acoustic communication at short range uh, can actually be quite challenging as to maybe lots of multipod and reverberation at, uh, at short range, short range, while at, uh, at the longer range, these may uh, uh, have been canceled by, uh, by a soft bottom, uh, for example. And uh, also in specific environments like harbors, uh, you get also the, the reflections from the from the case, and other uh, structures that uh, that are there. And um, the same you can say for uh, so-called stationary configurations. It's often uh, uh, better to have actually a moving uh, transmitter and receiver, as these are maybe more stable. So an AUV that is uh, at, at depth uh, and at speed is um, uh, much more stable than uh, than a boat, than a little boat that is uh, rolling on the waves, uh, unless you have a very good uh, damper, of course. But uh, um, so it's it's about Doppler spread, not Doppler shift. And um, and the last slide that I want to present is that uh, in a few weeks' time at uh, NATO Redmond's trial, we will use this same modulation. So this high, uh, high bandwidth uh, uh, quality of service diversity and modulation. Uh, but now, so far in the, in the in the trials that I presented, it was um, all pictures that were pre-recorded and uh, and then transmitted in the water together with uh, with live position information. Uh, although we did an experiment with live images, but that was above water. Now we're going to do for the first time uh, recording live images from uh, underwater, from the bottom, mine-like objects, and uh, transmit them uh, live together with uh, position and uh, other metadata uh, to the operator that can then uh, decide about identification and disposal uh, measures. Uh, so this will, will be very exciting to do this uh, for the for the first time uh, live in a few weeks' time, and this was uh, part of a of a challenge for ONR that we uh, won uh, some time ago. 
Okay, I hope you did not miss too much with uh, the hiccups in the in the presentation. Um, and I'm happy to uh, to take some questions if they are. Many thanks uh, for the presentation, Henry. Um, it was a nice, uh, exciting overview of all the projects of a of a, a big part of a big list of projects that we did. Uh, at TNO. Uh, there are some questions. There's a question from Rosa. What do you want to ask it yourself, Rosa? Or I see I see it in the chat. But yeah. uh, so the uh, yeah the, the bandwidth uh, which was probably mentioned on the slide that you missed. Uh, so for our bottom nodes, uh, uh, we we have a, a 30 kilohertz uh, bandwidth, and uh, for our AOV, uh, 21 kilohertz bandwidth. And uh, the carrier is uh, around 30 kilohertz, so 28 to uh, 30 uh, kilohertz, depending on uh, the bottom note or the, or the AUV, differs a little bit. Yeah. And it's a, it's a single transducer, that's a commercial transducer that we uh, use for that. Well, thank you, Harry. Um, so, so in that case, you, your, your uh, signal is actually from something like 15 kilohertz to 45 kilohertz ish. Yeah. So the, the, for the bottom node, we have 17 to 47 and for the AUV is 21 to 42. So that was on the missed slide. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and what would be your uh, video data rate? Yeah, that uh, um, the experiment that we did in the Trondheim Fjord, we had uh, about seven, six or seven uh, images uh, per minute, uh, mm -hmm. and the the images were about uh, four kilobits uh, each, so they were quite coarse uh, images. But maybe, maybe maybe Henry, it's it's worth to mention that we didn't have the full duty cycle when we did that experiment, so we could have had more images during that experiment. Yeah, we, we always try to have uh, only fifty percent unit cycle max, so that we uh, don't load the transducer too much. But, um, There's one more question from Costas, and then I think we should continue to the next talk, uh, Costas. Do you perform Doppler compensation? Uh, yes, well, and how do you? We estimate the Doppler and we have a, a, a face lock. Do you resample the signal? No, we don't resample. Well, no, 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 no. So is it? Yeah, we yeah, resample. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> not, not, I thought you meant adaptive resampling. No, but we have, no, no, uh, no, no, no. So, uh, after the Doppler estimation, we resample the signal and then we have a face lock loop uh, tracking the face. Yeah. And uh, that's it. So, old school. So one one time a second order a second order PLL. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Henry, it's a second order PLL. Yeah, Kuhn no more no spoiler by the DCS. Yes. Okay. I trust Kuhn. <laughs> All right. Okay. If that were the questions for Henry, then okay. Many thanks, Henry. Then I. It's time for the next speaker, and that's he's already there in the. I already I can already see him. Uh, that's Filippo, and Filippo will talk about uh, event-based stack for data transmission through uh, multimodal in the water networks. Filippo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kuhn. Can you all hear me and see my screen? It seems very clear. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's that's great. So, uh, first of all, I really want to thank the session organizer, the ecoms organizer, and also all my author co-authors from uh, Wireless MR SRL and the University of Padova, as well as Professor Christian Renner and Fabian Steins for providing us uh, three Ahoy acoustic modems that are the three modems that we the, the modems we saw in the first day presented by Christian and and Fabian. I uh, also want to acknowledge Robovas that uh, partially uh, founded this, uh, this work uh, through the Martera Eranet co-found uh, 
uh, European system. And uh, now that I acknowledge everyone, I really want to start with the presentation by first of all, telling you what we mean with multimodal underwater networks. So as we saw in the last days, uh, there are uh, not only acoustic comms, but also but also optical comms, uh, electromagnetic and magnetic inductive modems, uh, and different types of uh, acoustic uh, uh, communication technologies, such as low frequency and uh, high frequency. And in some application, the combination of multiple technologies with a system that decides uh, whether to transmit with low frequency, acoustic, high frequency, acoustic, optical, or other devices uh, can really help achieving uh, better performance. Uh, we saw the example during the optical comms of uh, a system that was uh, using an uh, underwater drone for collecting data from sensors, as well as uh, ROV that was uh, partially controlled with optical and acoustic comms. And uh, given that uh, we understand that there's the need of combining technologies in order to uh, uh, try to uh, enable uh, these types of applications. So now let's, uh, I want to tell you at least uh, the Padova vision on the steps for evaluating underwater networks, starting from the requirements, because they should uh, enable some applications. You design the network according to these requirements, do some analysis and simulations in order to see whether the system you designed is actually uh, enabling, the, uh, respecting these requirements and uh, try and the simulations and analysis is used also for optimize uh, the protocols you designed. Then you go to the C trial to test that everything works and eventually if everything works, you can go for final deployment. If something didn't work, you should go back and try again. So in the case you are using, uh, uh, you are developing twice the uh, protocol you designed, sometimes you can encounter some errors due to bu uh, implementation bugs. So it's not a good idea developing once the system that is uh, the, the protocol that is simulated and uh, re-implement the same protocol uh, for the C trial. Why? Because uh, of this, the uh, possibility to have this kind of bugs. and. Uh, uh, for this reason, uh, there's the need of a tool for design, simulate, and realize a C trial uh, without rewriting the uh, same code twice. And for this, uh, uh, 10 years ago, we started the development of uh, Desert Underwater. Uh, now uh, that uh, desert was initially used only for uh, simulating and test uh, uh, underwater acoustic networks. Now that uh, also optical systems start to be mature and available off the shelf, and other devices are available as well. And uh, the fact that we proved that uh, the combination of uh, multiple acoustic modems uh, used together can provide uh, big advantages, uh, we started uh, uh, experimenting uh, multimodal comms with desert. So uh, we started by simulating them and then uh, we, uh, thanks to the fact that uh, swapping the, simu the simulated physical layer and uh, switching on real devices, uh, we can test uh, the, uh, si the uh, simulated system in a C trial, we also uh, start uh, simu uh, testing multimodal networks in the sea with desert. To do, to do so, uh, we had to redesign uh, all the modem drivers uh, and uh, include more modems uh, in desert. So for this, uh, we uh, develop new drivers, uh, in particular the Structor now as a base class called UW modem that is extended for each of the uh, modems that are supported in desert, specifically Evologix modems, the Aoi modem, that is uh, the low cost acoustic modem presented uh, by Fabian on Monday, on Tuesday, sorry, and the uh, CSA modem, that CSA stands for client server architecture and supports whatever modem uh, provides an Ethernet, Ethernet transparent uh, interface, uh, such as uh, if you think about the surface Wi Fi or uh, an Ethernet switch, uh, or even the Bluecom modem, because uh, 
uh, who used the Bluecom modem uh, that is an optical modem uh, uh, developed by uh, sold by Sonardyne in uh, in Europe, but developed by the Woodsol Oceanographic Institute, uh, is uh, knows that it provides uh, a Ethernet uh, transparent interface. So for doing uh, uh, this, uh, the main issue for uh, using uh, real devices uh, with a uh, event-based uh, uh, simulator is the synchronization between the real hardware events and the uh, simulator events. To do so, we uh, create an event queue where all the events that happens in the real time, so whenever a packet is received from a modem, for instance, uh, it pushes event in the event queue, and there is a desert timer that checks periodically whenever there are there is something inside uh, inside this queue. So the synchronization is done by basically polling with a timer uh, this queue, and uh, of course, there is a gap between the synchronization performance and uh, the CPU load. So from our uh, experiments, we get an uh, average synchronization error of 5 milliseconds uh, with a CPU load of 4% when using a Core i7 uh, processor. And this has been tested by transmitting an image of 2,345 bytes. Because with Desert now, we also transmit uh, real data and not synthetic data, so we can also see the quality of uh, experience that a user can have when uh, testing some, uh, some applications. So now the uh, evaluation of the system, we uh, tried three different setups. The first one in the left is by using the AOI modem in our water tank. Uh, the uh, two uh, red uh, uh, hydrophones here are uh, the, uh, uh, the transducers used from the AOI modems. Then we did the test with two Evologics 1834 modem inside our water tank and with two Evologics modem, uh, two emulated Evologics modem with a DMATCH emulator hosted in Germany and accessed from Padova via VPN. Finally, we did a test of the CSA client server architecture just connecting laptops with an Ethernet switch. Here the uh, results. What I'm showing here are, is the reception rate of uh, each of, uh, of the modem. In particular, we can see that for each modem we have two bars. The one in the left represents the performance uh, that uh, we get when using desert, and the one in the right, uh, the uh, reception rate when desert was not used, but we just used uh, the tool uh, that uh, the modem provider gave us. So with the AOE modem, uh, we get uh, a little bit more than 200 bits per second when uh, using desert, and uh, only five bytes, bit, only five bits per second more when not using desert. So 205 bits per second. So pretty similar. With the S2C. Uh, with the Evologics uh, use the in instant message mode, that means uh, that, that when you tell them to transmit a short message, they will do it without using any MAC, an additional MAC layer. Uh, we got exactly the same performance of when using desert and without using desert. Instead, we get a little different performance when using the uh, instant messages with the emulator that was hosted in Germany via VPN. And this is because with Desert, we query the modem to understand whether it, the packet has been transmitted or not. And we do not transmit another packet until we get back an answer. But due to the VPN that had a delay of uh, 32 milliseconds, uh, we uh, transmitted the next packet uh, uh, quite late due to this additional delay caused by the VPN and not by uh, the software itself. Instead, when using directly Evologix modem with uh, burst mode, burst mode is a mode where you just give the modem the data and they uh, optimally manage their uh, internal 
queues by chunking the data and uh, deciding the best bitrate available, uh, the retransmission, and so on. Uh, so here we had a little difference when using desert and without using desert, and this is due to the fact desert uh, has its own MAC layer and does not uh, allow uh, transmission if the modem did not acknowledge uh, that the, tra the uh, transmission that was uh, uh, performing has finished. So, uh, due to this fact uh, that Desert was managing the queue itself instead of letting the modem managing the queue optimally, uh, we had this gap of performance. And so we did uh, when using uh, uh, the emulator due to both the fact that uh, the emulated modem had a higher bit rate uh, and the fact that there, there is a VPN in the middle. So we finally did a test to see whether uh, Desert is actually a bottleneck or not when talking about uh, underwater network uh, by uh, keeping the same CPU load of uh, 4% and connecting uh, to laptops uh, through an Ethernet switch. Uh, and what we get uh, is a, uh, a data rate of 8 megabit per second. That is uh, actually the data rate, uh, the maximum data rate uh, achievable when transmitting from a node to another one with the Bluecom modem, proving that uh, Desert can be used for uh, transmitting uh, actual data uh, with the real devices uh, without being a bottleneck for an underwater network. We also did a test, uh, uh, this is the, the last test we did that is a, uh, in, in, for, for this work, that is a multi-hope, multimodal network where there is one node transmitting with the AOI modems, a central node receiving the uh, acoustic AOI modems that are here in the tank, uh, and uh, transmit and forward in the packet to a third node via uh, via socket uh, through uh, Ethernet switch. And the performance we get here are again about 200 per second, that is uh, the bitrate achievable with the OI modem uh, with this uh, specific configuration. By concluding, uh, we extended the desert by including uh, uh, the support for more modems and prove that it can be uh, used for uh, testing uh, uh, actual application by sending uh, images. Uh, and in the future, we want to evaluate uh, it in a, in a C trial. Actually, we already did it in the context of Robovas in the Hammore uh, test campaign uh, at the end of last year uh, by uh, transmitting data in a dat data mulling scenario that were collected from some major node to the server hosted by uh, Fraunhofer CML. This concludes my presentation. If you have any question, I will be happy to answer. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Filippo, for your presentation. Um, are there any questions? I do not see any questions in the chat yet. Um, although I, I have one question, uh, Filippo. Yeah. Um, in your multimodal test, I would, yeah. ex I would expect that the effective throughput will depend on the, on the packet size because you have overhead involved with each packet. And if you have a multimodal link, uh, um, the size of the packets of the overhead is uh related to the packet size you mentioned the packet sizes that you used in your experiment but how did you choose the packet sizes okay yeah so uh actually in this uh, tank test uh, the packet size uh, uh for the aoi modem where it was set to 32 bytes because uh, is the one we would have used in the uh in the actual test uh, that that is the one that we used in the actual test we did uh, at the end of last year for Robovas. And the 32 bytes was proven by uh, Christian and Fabian that was a size that provided quite a low uh, uh, packet error rate. So we kept that size according to 
what they uh, what they told us. Instead, uh, with the Vologix modem uh, with distant messages, we went we selected the 64 bytes. That is the maximum you can transmit uh, with the instant messages uh, and uh, Evologix modem, and. Uh, inst and uh, instead, with in burst mode, we set uh, the packet size to 512 bytes. Okay, so they were mostly dependent on the modem type that you used. Yeah, yeah, we could not. Uh, in this case, where there is a multimodal system, of course, you set the the packet size according. In this case, according to the uh, modem that is a kind of weaker, let's say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, uh, there's the possibility to fragment the packet inside desert. So there's a layer called UWAL that we have also used during the Raccoon project in the in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, that is actually fragmenting the packet if. A packet has a size that is uh, too big for being transmitted with a specific modem. So, in the case of a multimodal uh, system, uh, you can uh, I, uh, you can add this layer between the MAC and the modem in order to set the fragmentation. Okay. Okay, that's 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 clear. Um, thanks for that. Um, are, are there any more questions? If, if I may, this is uh, Roberto from uh, Petroccia from Hi, Roberto. I, I have uh, uh, two questions. So, uh, Filippo, thanks for the presentation. First question is, uh, you mentioned that there is a trade-off between the, you know, synchronization yeah. and uh, CPU load. And in, the, in what you use as a target of 4%, you have this delay of 5 milliseconds, which could be acceptable for some application, but for others may be uh, too much. Sure. So, just wondering, uh, uh, in real application, what is the value that you use? And then uh, second question is about uh, the, the multimodal system. So you basically you are, you have those multiple interface and you get data in and data out, but do you do any level of uh, optimizations in the sense that as I mentioned also already, you have, uh, you may have different packet sizes. So yeah. you may have short packets for a modem and another one supporting longer, so you can combine together you can uh, you can do a bunch of different things to to reduce the the load and the overhead as also mentioned uh, earlier Over yes so uh, to the first question that is uh, the uh, synchronization issue and uh, the uh, and in the real in the real application I've used the if five milliseconds was okay uh, what I can answer you is, uh, the, the answer is, it depends, because uh, if you have a data mulling scenario, for example, that is the one we tested for Robovas, where uh, a surface vehicle was uh, approaching submerged node and collecting data that was stored inside the node nodes from for uh, several hours, uh, having uh, a additional delay of 5 milliseconds is uh, is acceptable uh, instead uh, whenever you need uh, something a little bit more real time like uh, telemetry or uh, other uh, application of these types uh, you 5 milliseconds might not be enough and uh, you definitely need to uh, to increase this, uh, to decrease the synchronization uh, time, so having a higher CPU load for sure. So there is this trade-off. Uh, we set this in this way for this application was fine, but in other application we might use a, uh, uh, a you might you will need a higher CPU load. Instead, uh, uh, related to the Multimodal networks. Uh, in this case, uh, the, your question was whether we thought about optimizing, uh, for example, routing system or providing uh, uh, or handling uh, packets of different uh, sizes uh, uh, that are for different applications. And the answer is yes, we did. In the uh, last uh, seven years, we did. Uh, more than, I guess, 10 publications, 
some journal paper and some conferences about multimodal networks and several applications. We use uh, uh, the so-called multimodal layer that is a layer that and handles different applications and decides, for example, whether a video can be transmitted or not. Uh, we had this paper in Notions uh, where that uh, I did together with uh, Paolo Casari and Roy Diamant, where there were a set of divers, uh, uh, ROV, and a diver leader that was uh, mulling data from the divers to the ROV. Uh, and uh, and was transmitting our images and videos only when reaching the uh, our, the our range of the optical modem with the ROV, while transmitting uh, uh, images with the divers only with acoustic HF and SOS messages with the divers uh, using. Uh, acoustic uh, low frequency. Uh, this is just an example, but we had uh, quite a bit. And uh, there were some paper on, on heuristic on the way to decide uh, how to transmit the data, while uh, we had a uh, uh, journal paper on uh, optimal routing uh, and a letter uh, uh, on uh, optimal uh, MAC layer for multimodal networks. They, they are out since a few years, but uh, in the case you are interested, I can send you the link in the chat uh, in, after my presentation. Thank you, Philippe. Okay, many thanks, Philippe. Yeah, there are still two more questions. Wow. Um, Please, go ahead. There are still two more questions. Um, do we have time to answer those Chow, or are we uh, or will we have a break no please. No, no please go ahead with the, with okay. the questions I'm okay talking. yeah from a Manu hi Manu I don't know if Ma Manu are you there so he had a question um, you had a question on how the performance. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now we can hear you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry. Uh, hi, Philip. This is Manu. So uh, I was just asking hi, Manu. about. Yeah, I was asking about the uh, last one of the last slides you had uh, the performance comparisons. Uh, the uh, one that you showed uh, for the CSA uh, UDP uh, performance, yeah, the purple one. Yeah. Was it actually using um, uh, optical modem or uh, what uh, did you use uh, for measuring this one? Just curious. Okay, here we just used uh, uh, for this test, we just use an uh, uh, Ethernet switch, actually, a very bad Ethernet switch. This uh, small switches you power by. Uh, by USB, you know, it's like ah, a okay. 10, 100 megahertz Ethernet switch. We Got had it. the opportunity to use the Bluecom modem for for a while, uh, but the results with the Bluecom modem have not been uh, presented here because uh, okay. we could not uh, manage to get the performance uh, because the mod was for an industrial project and they did not allow us to uh, use it for research purposes. Okay, thanks. Okay, I think that concludes the questions. Uh, many thanks, Filippo, for the presentation and for answering the questions. And I think we're already <laughs> already quite far in the break. Uh, what shall we do, Michelle? That, that's not a problem at all. I, as a matter of fact, I would like to call everyone's attention since we, we, we will we'll soon break for a small comfort break. Uh, we have on the audience uh, the IEEE OES Vice President for technical activities and uh, um, he, he asked me he asked me if he could uh, address the, the audience uh, very briefly on a few initiatives of the IEEE OES so if uh, if uh, venu can uh, can uh, uh, take the stage now for a minute or two venu M many yeah. of you will know venu yeah uh, am i audible 
Yes, you're uh, coming through. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jao. Uh, so as Jao said, I'm from Singapore. Um, my name is Venu. I work with Mandar, but not on underwater communications. Um, so I would like to introduce um, um, three uh, conference um, uh, that IEEE OES is um, um, sponsoring or co-sponsoring. Um, can I have the first one, Jao, the uh, first um, flyer on the screen? So the first one is the Ocean Science Meeting. It is not a conference uh, sponsored by um, IEEE OES, but it is a um, co-sponsored by uh, IEEE OES, and we are organizing a few sessions there. So as you know, I mean, the Ocean Science Meeting is uh, mostly um, uh, science people uh, getting together, and we thought that um, to um, understand more about the science, you need technology as well as um, you need uh, engineering. So we are trying to organize some sessions uh, for the... Um, uh, venue, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Are you going to show the flyers or were you expecting me to do that? Oh, uh, can you see that? Oh, I have to share the screen, is it? They, they are in the chat, uh, Jao. I, pa I pasted the links uh, in the chat. Yeah. yeah. But I don't know I if need, anyone I... wants, to, wants to show them or not. Hmm. I can, I can do that if you wish, if you're seeing them. I don't know if you are. Okay, okay, yeah. So this is the first one which I was talking about, the Ocean Science Meeting, where engineers meet scientists. That is the theme that we have given for the sessions. We are organizing seven um, sessions, scientific sessions, and one town hall. Uh, and one of the main theme is the, if you are familiar with uh, the UN Decade of Oceans. Um, so most of the themes are tied to the UN Decade of Oceans. And I would like uh, the participants to consider submitting abstract uh, for this uh, conference. And this is happening in during 27th February to 4th of March uh, in Hawaii. So hopefully, I mean, we are thinking some people can get together uh, in Hawaii. Um, so, Chao, can you share the second uh, one? Which so one do you want? The Chennai, uh, Oceans 22 Chennai. Okay. So, as you know, the Oceans is a conference jointly organized by IEEE OES and um, MTS, the Marine Technology Society. And for the first time, it is being organized in India and uh, it is in Chennai. Unfortunately, again, the COVID um, has come into play, but uh, the organizers are hoping that uh, Maybe, I mean, it, they are planning to do it as a hybrid conference. So um, we don't know yet, I mean, uh, whether people are able to travel. Um, so what I want to bring to your attention is that the abstract submission is closing on 6th September. So uh, please see that whether you can support this conference by submitting uh, papers to this conference. Um, okay, and then... The third one is uh, an IEEE OES sponsored uh, conference. This probably you are familiar with as well. This is called the AUB Symposium. So Singapore is hosting this AUB Symposium for the first time. Um, this conference is happening in 2022 20, September. Uh, one major attraction of this conference is that along with the conference, we organize uh, what is called a Singapore AUV Challenge. So this is a student competition. Uh, in 2019, we organized the last one and then COVID came and we couldn't organize uh, anything. And uh, we have a large international student uh, participants uh, present, uh, presenting the, their AUV technologies. So we had in 2019, 11 countries representing uh, students. Um, and um, we had about 300 students uh, participating. So this is a great uh, uh, occasion for, to get to know both um, uh, the symposium as well as about the 
student uh, competition. So uh, there is some time for that, but I would like to again uh, bring to your attention and mark your calendars for attending this conference. So that's it from me, Jao. Thank you for give, providing me yes. yeah. this opportunity to talk no to the participants. Yeah. No worries at all, Ben. I'm very welcome. So this was the moment, a word from our sponsor. So uh, it's <laughs> always good. Uh, anyway, I think we are now ready for a small comfort break. I would say since we are running just very slightly late, uh, I would propose we are here in five after the hour uh, and we resume with the next presentation. Is that okay with you, with you guys, Andrew and Kuhn? Yeah, that's uh, perfect. We can have a coffee. <laughs> yeah. All right, okay. perfect. See you with five after the hour. Yes. Thank you.
uh, the last uh, two presentations of the next generation adaptive modem architectures uh, uh, session. Uh, we now have a presentation of Jacob uh, Rudander from Kongsberg Maritime about uh, using FPGA implementation of a uh, real time Doppler estimator. So please, Jacob. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, so uh, we'll go through a uh, implementation and evaluation of this Doppler estimator that we developed a few years ago. <clears throat> and my plan with this uh, presentation is to give a short introduction to the Doppler estimator that is quite easily easy. It's based on a um, small bank of shifted replicas followed by uh, detection of the carrier offset and uh, show some um, problems that occurred during the implementation and some choices that was made in order to implement it. And I will then go a bit more into detail about the actual FPGA implementation itself and then end with some um, experimental results from a shallow water channel. But first, uh, the Doppler estimator, it's um, the first step is based on a bank of shifter replicas and this is a very commonly used method in order to estimate Doppler. So we could just have had a quite large Doppler bank and we could get the resolution we wanted in the Doppler estimate. However, that wouldn't be a very suitable uh, method for an FPGA because an FPGA has very little memory resources and um, we will also have to dedicate, uh, so we have to do all the processing in parallel. And by doing so, we have to dedicate certain resources to these Doppler banks, which couldn't be used to anything else. We would, uh, would have ended up with a quite uh, large and complex implementation that would, uh, both in terms of power and in terms of FPGA says and routing. So what we have to stand down is to use a quite small Doppler bank where we do a quite coarse um, estimation and then forward this estimation to a second step uh, for fine tuning. And this second step is uh, based on a detection of the residual carrier offset after the Doppler bank. And we do that by having two uh, channel probes in the start of the communication frame. And we try to measure the phase offset between, between the peaks of the ambiguity function of these two channel probes. And if we know the phase difference between them, which is, should be zero if there is no Doppler, we can quite easily calculate the carrier offset because the residual carrier offset times the time between these two ambiguity function peaks should be equal to the phase difference between them. So if we have a course estimate, we can quite easily calculate back to the uh, to the residual Doppler compression factor, this is alpha tilde here. So yeah, that's about everything about the Doppler estimator. But there are, of course, problems. Uh, in order to implement it, it, it's not on a very suitable form. Uh, it contains a division. It, uh, it would be quite resource demanding to implement FPGA. So we are going for an approximation. This Doppler, Doppler compression factor is much smaller than one often, so we can simply remove it, and this approximation will be sufficiently good for the application that we are targeting. And then we revert to a much easier expression to implement. We have a subtractum to find the phase difference between the ambiguity function peaks divided by a constant, which depends on the carrier frequency, the number of samples between the channel probes and the board rate. And all of that is known and can be pre-calculated. So, so it goes to be only be a subtraction and then a multiplication with a pre-calculated inversion of the constant term. And the second problem that uh, arises is that this phase estimate uh, might have, have might have phase ambiguities. If we have a Doppler that is so large that we get phase wrap during the, um, the estimation, but that can be avoided by having uh, several Doppler banks and try to space them such as we um, avoid having uh, ambiguities for the estimations. 
This is a bit more about the implementation details that we choose to evaluate this estimator. We have used to implement nine Doppler banks to cover plus minus uh, 1.92 meters per second. And they are spaced with about half a meter per second, these Doppler banks. And all of these nine Doppler banks outputs um, um, match filtering or creation for each sample that arrives. And then we det detect uh, this sample, the max sample of this, and see if it's over a threshold. And if it's over a threshold, we say that we have a detection of the first uh, ambiguity function. And then that goes on into a cordic to find the phase and that is stored. And then we change the content of these Doppler banks to the second probe and do a similar detection in order to find a phase difference for to fine tune this estimate. And we have chosen uh, probe lengths of 511 symbols, which fits nicely into the memory resources of the FPGAs. So we end up with 18 memories, uh, block ROMs in the FPGAs, and three multiplications per Doppler bank, and then some resources in the fabric. And for this test, we used a board rate of 81 kilobolts per second, and it's uh, centered on 250 kilohertz carrier. And the place for evaluation of this Doppler estimator is the Horton Inner Harbor. It's a small uh, in natural harbor surrounded by land. It's a one kilometer across, and it's quite shallow water. Always happen. Yes. <laughs> and this is located in the yeah. Oslo Fjord. For <laughs> and, yes, and this um, first channel that we tried is a 100 meter channel between a raft and a Yeti, both uh, fixed uh, and um, the, um, also 100 meters and the depth was around five meters. And uh, as before the measurement started, we did a sounding uh, of the channel and it's relatively easy. It's a direct arrival followed by a surface reflection which carries some Doppler spread and uh, uh, carries uh, some part, uh, around 10 to be lower than the direct path. And we also have some residual uh, or some, uh, some residual phase movement in this channel, and that's because of the um, carrier and the clock offset between the receiver and transmitter because there was no actual movement in this channel. But in order to test the Doppler estimator, we had to infer Doppler somehow to this channel, and we did it by resampling the signal before transmission to a given velocity, and then try to estimate it back at the receive side. And we had, uh, and it was between minus two and two meters per second, and around 10 frames for each step. And as you can see in the right figure here, it matches quite good. We're able to estimate fairly well within a few centimeters per second for all the targeted velocities. But uh, this was a high SNR channel, but we also did some experimentation in a low. SNR channel or varying SNR channels. And this is a channel B. It's between the same raft where the receiver was mounted, and um, but this time the transmitter was attached to a ship, which was moved between 140 and 650 meters at the depth of and the depth of this horizontal channel was about nine meters. And this channel uh, was uh, sounded during the interval, and this is a quite representative uh, snapshot of this channel, and it was uh, quite interesting, really. It occurred uh, after a period of very, very cold weather and a very calm day, and uh, it looks quite terrible. It's spread out over, over seven milliseconds, and it contains several arrivals of quite similar strength. But despite this frightening appearance, it was not very difficult to estimate the velocity. It was quite stable over the time of both the communication frame and the um, and, uh, channel probes for estimation. So, so it, it was not very difficult. And we were able to estimate the velocity of the, this boat that was moving away with one meter per second 
fairly well out to around 500 meters where we had some problems with the SNR dropped too much so we started to lose some um, acquisitions. But, uh, and that's also the reason why we have irregular spacing between the sample, between the estimates of the velocity when we get quite far out in time. But as you can see, the estimates are correct when we detected the probes, but so it functioned quite well also here. And the third channel that we were um, tested in was um, also a shallow water channel. And here, but here the transmitter was attached to a small ROV which was roaming around the distance of between 10 and 20 meters. And here the receiver was fixedly mounted to the to a wall instead. And this channel is uh, a piece of two very strong arrivals. And all the Doppler here comes from the actual movement of the ROV. There are no, the surface was completely calm or did this measurement. And this is an indirect measurement of the velocity because uh, we didn't have exact motion of the ROV. And the blue curve in the figure to the right is the estimated velocity of this ROV. And the red one is the output SNR from the receiver when we use this information of the estimated velocity to drive a resample uh, before the um, receiver. And when we do so, we get a fairly good output SNR regardless of the movement of the ROV. And uh, the stippled line here is uh, the same, but we didn't use the estimate to drive the resampler. We can see that they only correspond when the movement of the ROV was uh, zero. So, to summarize this presentation, we have implemented a Doppler estimator in FPGA, and it was relatively resource, uh, not very resource consuming. And, uh, it was based on a small bank of shifted replicas to a rough estimate, and then a fine tuning during the phase. And it functioned quite well in those three shallow water channels that we tested it in. And uh, it was able to estimate the velocity within a few centimeters per second, which was sufficient for our receiver. So, are there any questions? Thank you, uh, Jaco. So, are there echo? Echo. Someone has a microphone open. Perhaps there's a big echo. You hear still the echo? No, it's good now. Yeah. Okay. So I see a, a question in the in the chats from AT. Who's that? You see the question, Jacob? Oh, no, sir. Maybe the. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes. As I see the question, uh, any critical path issues? Uh, no, we, we spend. Uh, if, if you mean by critical path by timing, uh, excuse me, so guys. Just for, just for the interest of uh, of uh, uh, replay in the future, can someone read it out loud? Uh, if AT is not available to read, perhaps I, I will read it then. So, Jacob, thanks for the presentation. In the FPGA implementation, did you encounter any critical path issue? If so, how did you attack it? That's the first one. Yes, uh, no, we have no, yeah, if you mean critical path by um, the timing in the FPGA, so no, we didn't have any of these. We spent uh, quite a lot of time um, putting uh, registers in all critical functions and uh, at the memories, so uh, had no issues with the timing there. Okay, and then the second question is, using filter banks for each hypothesized velocity, we are limited in terms of resolution. If we want to close the loop and find the Doppler scaling factor in an iterative fashion, what are the challenges from FPGA implementation point of view? 
Yes, I would say it goes for the memory resources. Yeah. And uh, we, we, in this time we had streaming data, so we had no time to buffer any, yeah. any information. Uh, it was streaming continuously, and we have to do the processing in, in real time. Yeah, so storing, uh, storing more than one sample at a time. Yeah, so although uh, this is a very specific implementation uh, paper, the the, the, the streaming uh, approach is quite interesting, I would say. That. So um, I will have another look in your paper about that some time ago. But, um, very interesting, thanks. So. If there are no more questions, do you have one, cool? Grammarly is a digital writing assistant that caters to all types of individuals, whether you're trying to sound professional in an email or drafting up a critical report for school or work. Yeah, so um, maybe a uh, last question. Um, um, you are, um, Jacob, you are working at, working at Kongsberg, a commercial modem uh, company. Uh, has this already ended up in a Kongsberg product or? <laughs> not really uh, no, no, not yet. It was mostly for research purposes to make this. Yeah, okay. Because it's quite high TRL, of course, FPGA uh, implementation. Okay. Then I think uh, we just go to the next one. Make a little bit up of the time that we lost before. So, Kuhn, you want to introduce the next speaker? Yeah, so the next uh, speaker, he's already ready, <laughs> is Amir uh, Tadayon, and he'll, he will talk on mitigating channel time variation effects in acoustic OFDM systems. Amir, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so, hello everyone, uh, I'm Amir Tadayon, as uh, Kuhn said. And I'm very pleased to uh, basically present my work with Professor Stojanovic on mitigating channel time variation effect in acoustic OFDM systems. So in this title, we see like three keywords. Uh, one is like the mitigation approaches, the other one is the time variation effect, and then OFDM systems. And I will talk about these keywords in reverse order. So let's jump into the first slide, which is basically a quick uh, background synchronization on OFDM systems as standing for orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. This is like a multi-carrier scheme and it basically eliminates the interfere and the intersymbol interference when we are transmitting our signals through multipass channel. On the top left uh, you see one the realization of the multipass channel. So if the signal uh, basically the signal duration is much less than the uh, the multipass is spread then the signal will suffer from the intersymbol interference. And uh, basically, from frequency perspective, the signal bandwidth should be much larger than the channel bandwidth. Then we are having the frequency selective channel that introduces multipass fading on the signal. And how the OFDM basically tackles this issue is basically chop the bandwidth into smaller pieces so that each carrier is experiencing a flat fading channel. So on the top uh, right figure, you see one. Uh, frame of the OFDM uh, and this base, this OFDM frame it contains several OFDM blocks and which are basically encompassed between the preamble and postamble. And each OFDM block basically con contains or conveys data symbols D sub K over here, which are modulating data uh, carriers. Uh, and we have K of those carriers, and these carriers are what delta F apart, and the duration of each carrier is one over delta F, which makes these big, basically these carriers orthogonal within the OFTM duration. And then we also introduce some guard interval, which is more, uh, larger Plans than the uh, multipass spread With roadmaps of the channel and software, to avoid quickly adapt and adjust to changing priorities. Staying so safe uh, basically the beauty of OFDM um, is great. to basically use this well, usually right now, I would the say carrier like at the receiver side and then at the uh, and bottom morning, right um, you see great. a multi-channel receiver well, usually right now, uh, that is basically like uses that, that basically uses the FFT implementation and use this fundamental relationship between the post-FFT symbols, the channel frequency response at the kth carrier, and the 
transmitted data symbol G sub K plus noise. And we can use some like for incoherent receiver, we use channel estimation to extract the channel information and do the data detection using uh, multi uh, using maximum ratio uh, combining and uh, when we have the luxury of multi-channel which is required in underwater so basically OFDM uh, offers a simple receiver using FFT processing and not only that it also basically uh, offers possibility of differentially coherent detection that I will comment about it uh, in few slides later and but these um, basically so it also offers and its scalability, MIMO possibility, and all these advantages come uh, at the cost of sensitivity to time variation. As we all know, there is no free lunch, basically. And in underwater, basically, the time variation has two sources. One is basically the inherent changes, which are modeled as like a fan random phenomena. And the other one is due to the relative motion between TX and RX, which introduces Doppler shift to the signal. And uh, the bottom line is that if we do not compensate for these uh, time variation, uh, this time variability destroys the fundamental principle of the OFTM, which is the orthogonality between the carrier. And then that's introduced, that introduces the intercarrier intersymbol or ICI, and then we have performance uh, degradation in the system. So uh, how can we basically attack this uh, problem of the time variability in the channel? So as I mentioned, the relative motion introduces some structure distortion to the signal. For example, on the top right figure, you see the effect of the Doppler distortion due to the uh, relative motion between TX and RX. For example, if the receiver moves towards the uh, transmitter, we are shrinking, the signal duration gets shrunk in the, in the time domain and it gets expanded in the frequency domain. While when the receiver goes away from the transmitter, we have the, the signal gets dilated in the time and get shrunk in the bandwidth. So one way to tackle this problem is to use the preamble and postamble and measure the received signal duration and then use the resampling at the front end. But is this resampling sufficient? Well, the answer is not. So we need, it's necessary. Of course, it's necessary to do the coarse resampling at the front end, but it's not sufficient. For example, take one extreme case over here. So for example, if the each transmitted signal to transmitted block uh, experiences uh, a specific Doppler so that the overall net under the receiver uh, duration is going to be zero, then the coarse resampling does not compensate the, the effect of the Doppler. So we need to basically have some mechanism to tackle the Doppler distortion in each individual block. All right, so uh, as we all know, so the uh, success of the uh, various communication techniques depends on our ability to uh, basically model the signal. And uh, so, and also it's good to always go back to the fundamentals uh, first. So over here we see the received uh, signal model when the channel is time invariant. And we, so basically we assume that uh, the coarse sampling is perfectly, is perfect and it does its job uh, in, like, in an excellent fashion. So we have a time invariant channel. We do some match filtering, which can be implemented using FFT and then extract our sufficient statistics from that. And then these uh, sufficient statistics can go into the equalizer and extract our data symbols. In the time varying channel though, we need to basically have a match filtering for each carrier. Then that match filtering is matched to the channel time varying coefficient, which we basically uh, split the effect of the time variability into two parts. So one is basically the frequency offset uh, that I denoted over here with beta, and then the residual time variation is lumped into the channel uh, frequency response coefficient h sub k for each receiver. So we basically tackle this problem in two steps. One, we some, uh, compensate for the frequency offset, and then we uh, tackle the problem of the time variability in the channel coefficient. So this uh, optimal receiver over here is too complex. So we need to basically come up with some practical approaches. So first, let's see how we do the frequency offset. Uh, so the frequency offset is basically based on the differential core and detection. 
And just a quick detour over here on, on the top right, you see a, a snapshot of the I think we lost the connection. Oops. We lost the connection to Amir. Let's wait for a bit. I can try to text him and see if he knows. That that's that's a good uh, idea, Milika. Hold on one second. Yeah, yeah. Because he maybe he doesn't notice it. Maybe, maybe he's probably speaking. Heavily. Yeah, yeah. That might be the case. <laughs> Thank you, Milica. Yeah, you, you don't see the chat. I think when you're presenting, at least I don't. Yeah. All right. But he, so knows, online he, solar. A, he probably turned his phone off, not to disturb him while he's giving <laughs> a presentation. <laughs> so Don't maybe walk. now I lost. Okay. Well, other than being concerned for him, I do have the slides. What if we try a bit of shock therapy? Yeah. Like, like, we, uh, let me see. I don't know if we can, if I can kick him out. So yeah, maybe you can correct. share his presentation. Uh, network issue. Sense. Amir, okay. Yeah. Amir said he texted me back, says network issue. All right. Um, okay. So I'm sorry, what were you saying, Joao, that we, that we could do what? No, who was it? Because if we were having doubts that if you would know if it was in or not, I could try to kick him out because this would force put some uh, some action on his side to come in again. So, but but if but he's kick a, him out, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> Are you in take the over. Meantime, <laughs> could, could you take over maybe for a minute? Um, I can take over. I just need to find. Need to go to the other computer. Anybody remembers what page did he? Yes, it's so, uh, it's five. Yeah, it's five, five. Hold on, give me one second. I need to log in from my other computer. Or while I'm logging in, try asking any questions that you may have so far. Okay. Link. See when these things happen in the. Oh, this is something that would never happen in a real Ucoms, right? Well, it never <laughs> has happened in all the the thing. It seems to be on his side, though, Joe. Don't worry. <laughs> Amir sure. has joined. No, Amir, I just had a chance to take over. Oh, he's back. <laughs> he's back. He's back. From your slide five. Fine. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, I got some uh, net issue over here. Uh, so let me just share my screen again. So, so, you, were, so you were at slide five. Uh, at least at our side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you, can you see the slides? Yeah. No, we only see them. Yeah, we see the full screen now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was uh, basically talking about the differential current detection approach. So we basically can 
estimate our data symbols using just simple division and that basically promotes higher bandwidth efficiency because this uh, data detection is based on the assumption that the channel uh, basically channel coefficient from one carrier to the next does not change much and we are using basically the frequency correlation between the channel coefficients so the entire basically this frequency offset estimation approach is based on this differential coherent detection and the idea is very simple but elegant so here is the idea suppose that we have a bag of like hypothesized values for the frequency offset we apply we basically compensate for one and then we do our differential coherent detection we estimate our data symbols and as, suppose that we have some uh, pilots so we can form this uh, sum squared of the error between the estimated data symbol uh, as well as the pilot uh, values so we can form this error and then we apply this uh, approach iteratively uh, for each hypothesized value so we can form this uh, sum squared error over here and as you see this has some global minima why it's it looks like like an inverted sink uh, and it also has some like local minima as well so that's not an issue for now but uh, can so when, when we use like hypothesized values as i mentioned in the uh, question for the previous uh, presenter uh, so these hypothesized values we are basically limited in terms of resolution and we need to basically uh, repeat this uh, uh, procedure for a couple of number of hypothesized values. Can we avoid this uh, res uh, resolution limitation and basically make the, uh, the approach faster? And the, the answer is yes, we just close the loop and then we use the stochastic gradient approach to guide our estimator. And this uh, basically, the guidance comes through the negative uh, of the gradient of the error the composite error which is formed across the number of carriers and the number of pilots we have and the approach is basically terminated after maximum number of iteration or based on some uh, threshold value so let's see how it works uh, in practice uh, so what you see over here is one uh, frame of OFTM bl uh, block and uh, one frame of OFTM which has eight blocks and uh, the top uh, left, the bottom left plot over here shows the evolution of the frequency offset through the blocks. Um, and then uh, what you see at the uh, bottom right is basically the, the, the constellation of the, uh, the, detected data, uh, the detected data symbols. So we achieve minus 18 dB performance uh, using differential coherent detection and only eight pilots. Uh, this is the key feature of the approach. So some uh, technical issues over here is how we basically uh, start the iteration. So uh, the first uh, for the first block we use the hypothesized value, and what for the second from the second block and on we use the previous block estimate to initialize our uh, stochastic gradient approach, and also we use some uh, two uh, the two point approximation of the second equation to basically make the approach faster. All right, that, that was the basically how we tackle the frequency offset estimation. So let's see if we can go ahead and do the uh, attack the time variation in the channel uh, frequency response coefficient. So the idea is quite elegant. So we can project our the channel uh, time variation, the, the time varying channel into uh, decomposed into some uh, coefficients using some basis functions, which I denoted over here with phi. So with that, we basically, the idea of the partial FFT and module demodulation is basically very simple. We divide our OFDM duration into some uh, non-overlap duration, and then we project our channel into those functions and get the channel coefficients. And with that, we can basically exploit the channel information before FFT without any like uh, further complexity in the receiver, as opposed to the match filtering, and reduce the match filtering problem into estimating some coefficients. So we apply the FFT on each individual uh, interval, and then combine the output of these FFTs uh, very judiciously so that we can sub we can uh, suppress the ICI and this uh, partial FFT gives us uh, extra uh, 
degree of freedom to uh, combat the ICI issue in the OFDM systems. So how we basically choose these uh, coefficients, we propose two methods, uh, one based on the coherent detection, the other one is based on differential uh, coherent detection. So let's see uh, what is the coherent uh, aided approach. And so in the coherent aided approach, we com after combining the partial FFT outputs, if we, let's assume that we have the channel uh, estimate so we can form our uh, data uh, symbol estimate and then uh, do some like decision on it or if we are in the uh, pilot aided mode we can use the pilots uh, to form uh, to basically form the error between the the d tilde times the h hat minus the post FF, uh, after combining the, FF, the partial fft outputs uh, so with this error and also using the, the decision uh, from the data symbol, we can update our channel coefficients and then using some RLS or LMS approach with the input, which, which are basically the post uh, partial FFT symbols and to basically uh, update our combining coefficients. <laughs> and then we uh, repeat this procedure through the entire uh, frequency and from the first carrier up to the K minus one carrier. And then and since we are having a sequence of blocks of OFDM, we can repeat this for the next block. And, and based on the fact that the, and we, we can use basically the previous block estimates to initialize the next block and then do the iteration in a reverse order from the uh, highest carrier to the lowest carrier and then repeat the entire procedure for the, the whole frame. And this way we can basically save some pilot data and uh, improve the bandwidth efficiency of the system. All right, so in the <coughs> differential aided combining approach, uh, we basically, we do not need to know the channel uh, knowledge uh, and we can basically form our uh, estimate of the differentially en encoded data symbols, BK by just a single uh, division. And then we form the error to basically find our MMSE solution of the combining. So one technicality here is that this, uh, we assume that the previous uh, combining coefficient are very similar to the uh, current carrier combining coefficient. And using that, we can form, uh, we can basically form the gradient and uh, using this uh, stochastic gradient approach to guide our estimator of the combining coefficients. So as an alternative to this, <coughs> MMSE solution, we can linearize it uh, using uh, by the assumption that the uh, previous carrier does not depend on the combining coefficients. And we linear using this linearization, we can use uh, the uh, RLS or LMS approach uh, using these inputs, uh, which is basically a normalized version of the previous carrier post FFT, post partial FFT uh, output. And we, with the chronic chronic product of the current uh, <coughs> symbols, with the current post uh, partial FFT symbols, and the, uh, the, the error, which is basically the error between the uh, data symbol uh, at that carrier minus the, our estimate using the uh, differential maximum ratio combining. So this is the idea of the differential aided combining approach. And now we basically test our system on um, experimental data, uh, which was collected in June 2010 in mobile acoustic communication experiment or MACE. So here you, you see the, <coughs> the geometry of the experiment. We have a TX at the depth of 40 to 60, and it was moving at the speed of like 0.5 to 1.5 meter per second. And then we have a, an anchored uh, receiver with 12 receiving elements, and each receiving element is like 12 centimeter apart. And we, in, in this experiment, we have 52 transmission, and that spans like three and a half hours. <coughs> and the depth of water is like 100 meters. So the distance between the TX and RX is around like three to seven kilometers in this experiment. So the acoustic band of the signal transmitted during the experiment uh, ranges from 10, 10 and a half to 15 and a half kilohertz. And uh, in this, uh, in this paper, we showed the results using the 1024 carriers uh, signals, <coughs> signals with 1024 carriers, 
uh, which are modulated using QPSK. And the, the, each OFDM block is basically 16 millisecond, uh, has a 16 millisecond of guard interval. So we are basically <coughs> transmitting data at 7.6 7 kilobit per second and using 187 uh, pilots to do channel estimation and frequency offset est uh, estimation as well as the uh, partial FFT combining. And uh, we achieve 1.5 bit per second per hertz uh, as our bandwidth efficiency. So <clears throat> here is one <clears throat> result that shows basically the average of mean square error in data detection versus the number of partial FFTs we use. And uh, so how to read the plot is basically we have two uh, two systems uh, in terms of frequency offset if we, if we have used the frequency offset it's shown with the solid line and the dashed line shows the system without frequency offset estimation so the triangle uh, shows that <coughs> we are not using the partial fft so as you see over here this black dashed line with triangle marker uh, is basically a system with coarse resampling only. And as you see, we are not, uh, we cannot detect our data symbol just using only uh, coarse resampling. And uh, so using the differential uh, aided combining, we see that we have, as we increase the number of partial FFTs, uh, we have some uh, like uh, optimal value for the number of partial FFTs. So the performance increase. Uh, improves as we increase the number of partial FFTs for coherent, for differential coherent, differential aided combining, but there's an optimal point for that. For the coherent case, uh, as we increase the number of partial FFTs, we increase the, the performance increases as well. When we use the frequency offset compensation approach, we basically uh, eliminate all the uh, time variability in the channel, basically. That's why we have some, like, so the improvement in terms of a mean square error is like very negligible compared to the cases when we have, we do not have uh, frequency offset compensation, uh, but it still improves the system with one dB when we use partial FFT approach. And uh, when uh, two or four uh, partial FFT plug, uh, partial FFT uh, process, uh, Operation we can improve, uh, we can get an excellent performance, and uh, we achieve like minus seventeen dB performance using both uh, frequency offset compensation as well as the partial FFT demodulation. So with MQ equals one, we we are basically back in the conventional FFT receivers. So we see that uh, we we gain minus we gain ten dB over here using frequency offset compensation. And if we just use uh, partial FFT demodulation, we are gaining like uh, minus four, d uh, four dB or uh, minus, uh, nine dB gain over here using only frequent uh, partial FFT demodulation. So since the channel variation is random, the mean square error in data detection is also a random uh, variable. So we can plot its uh, CDF, which is basically the probability that the mean square error below, uh, goes below some certain value. And over here, we see that using uh, partial FFT, we can achieve a performance of minus seven dB for 90% of the OFTM blocks. And when we basically combine the both the partial FFT with the frequency offset approach, we gain uh, minus uh, 16 dB performance for 90% of the block using only two partial FFTs. And over here, the same uh, uh, performance metric CDF versus uh, CDF of the mean square error, but now using four partial FFTs. And now let's see that uh, what is the percentage of the uh, blocks that we, that, we, that achieves uh, minus 15 dB performance. So we see that using partial FFT only, we have 70% of the block achieving minus 15 dB uh, mean square error. With frequency offset only, we achieve, it, uh, we achieve like 80% of the blocks. And then we basically combine the two effects and uh, the two approaches, we achieve 95% 
which is excellent and uh, it's quite remarkable. All right, uh, so with that, I'm going to conclude uh, the, uh, this, the talk with some uh, takeaway messages. Uh, so resampling is a must, but not sufficient when we are transmitting our symbols through time varying channel. Uh, we uh, use the partial FFT approach that basically provides uh, 4 dB and 9 dB gain when we have two or four partial FFT intervals and we just use only the partial FFT. Uh, and these gains uh, are basically uh, achieved and compared to the conventional OFTM receiver. So the frequency of compensation, when we uh, Combine it with the partial FFT deliver and mean square error below minus 15 dB for 95% of OFTM block in the experiment. So this basically uh, shows that uh, if we combine the frequency of compensation with partial FFT, we are basically uh, capable of uh, compensating for fine ICI, and which allows for higher bandwidth efficient, higher using number of uh, higher number of carriers, and thus higher bandwidth efficiency. And uh, so stay tuned and uh, we have more uh, results and more uh, nice results about this and uh, it will be uh, shared with the community very soon. So with that, I'm uh, happy to take any questions if there is any. Okay, thanks a lot, Amir, for the very interesting talk <laughs> uh, and the very the nice results that you that you showed. I have a um, uh, are there any questions from uh, the audience? I have some. I have two. May I? Costas, yeah, you may. Yeah, of course. Uh, um, Amir, great talk as always. Um, uh, quick question regarding these question, these uh, results that you just presented. Uh, do they include also uh, multi-channel combining from the, from different hydrophones or just? Uh, single uh, it's a CISO system no it, the it's first a, question uh, and the second system. question is sorry it, it's a simo system i i basically use the it's a simo system. it's a simo system so you are using also it's a hydrophone that you're a hydrophone array that you're using right, right. so uh, i just i use uh, all two, 12 uh, i was wondering if you tried only a single hydrophone what was the feeling that you that you got there with a single hydrophone mm -hmm. I, I do not have the results uh, for that, but uh, it's uh, I we know that with single hydrophone we, we may not have a good performance, but uh, we can we can talk about this one offline. But I do not have the results for now for the single. Okay. Okay. The the other question I have is, uh, uh, to my understanding, is uh, you are using a single uh, parameter to estimate for the carrier offset, and that comes from, let's say, uh, a mean, uh, let's say, uh, assuming that all paths more or less have the same uh, motion, the same Doppler. I'm wondering if you have tried uh, in channels where you have uh, paths with, significant, with significantly different Dopplers, how, how does this uh, method perform? Well, uh, we, we haven't tried it. We do not have the data for such a channel. Uh, if you have any data, we are we can uh, basically try it on those data as well. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I Thank you. Your, Thank you. You are, saying, uh, you are saying that this uh, single param. So the way that we model this uh, was basically we resample with one common coarse Doppler scaling factor, and then we uh, extract one common frequency offset for the entire uh, uh, system, meaning all the receiving elements, and then lump everything. So uh, we are not saying that each all path have the same common Doppler factor. Common, we are saying that we lump all, all the residuals into this HKT. Yes, 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 so I, I, I agree, part, yes. The, the partial FFT job is to basically uh, suppress the ICI uh, due to the time variability of the channel. That that's the job. plus whatever plus Another whatever word. residual doppler you get in. Right. So I think uh, the boss has further input in that. <laughs> 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 Go on, Milica. Yes. I was just going to say, in other words, if you had the channel that you are describing, two paths with two different dopplers. 
that difference in Dopplers would supposedly be taken care of by the partial apathy. Yeah. It would not be taken Theoretically, care of explicitly. Yeah, yes. Yes, I mean, I I I I see the point. Yes, I'm just uh, wondering. I mean, have, my feeling though is that at some point we need to start having, uh, you know, Doppler compensation per path. I guess at some point. Yeah, I know it's a big discussion, <laughs> I, but I think, I think at some point we need to start having this. I mean, seeing these things. But, but anyway. Okay, thank, many thanks for your question, Kostas. Um, yeah, I know. If, I don't know if there's much time left for uh, questions. Um, we're already a bit over time. Um, so if there are no more questions, then I think uh, we should continue with the next talk. Oh, sorry, yeah, the next me? session, actually. <laughs> Indeed, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kun. Thank you very much, Henry, and the presenters that pop, uh, that did a great job during this session. Uh, if uh, everything's okay, we can move on to uh, uh, the next and final session of Newcoms. Uh, it's called uh, Channel Aware Security and Protocol Design, and was put together by these two fine gentlemen, Paulo Casari and Rol Otnes, that everyone knows well. So I will uh, end the floor to you guys to take us through the final three presentations of UCOMS. Yes. Thank you, Joao. Before starting, I just wanted to check. <laughs> Hello, I audio, you Paolo. See my... You're muted now. Paolo. Is it better now? Yes, now I can hear you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Joao. Thank you, everyone. I'm very glad uh, to be one of the organizers of this. Um, so, uh, Rold, if you don't mind, uh, we could do that. We could do a split between the first two and the last one, so that uh, uh, because I'm a co-author of the last paper of this session, maybe you can introduce that. Makes sense. Okay, great. So, thank you, everyone for, uh, first of all, being available to attend up to this time. I understand that for someone, uh, for some of you, this is the last uh, something in between uh, you and your, uh, well, dinner or beer, uh, rest of your morning or even bed, depending on where you are in the world. So um, I would uh, uh, like to thank you for being available to attend. And uh, I would like to thank uh, our speakers to for having sent uh, uh, very nice papers that, uh, in particular, uh, these two that I'm talking about, they've been uh, promoted with very fine votes. So I would like, without further ado, to give the stage uh, to Costas, who will present the first uh, of the papers in this session called Physical Layer Security Against an Informed Disdropper in Underwater Acoustic Channel. This is our part one of two papers. This uh, for part one is about feature extraction and quantization. So please, cost us the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Do I come across, okay? And yes, the slides are the slides here. And the slides are fine. Do you see the, 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 the first slide? Yes. Great. So I start. All right. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, let's uh, also change gears and talk a bit about encryption for uh, underwater acoustic networks. Uh, the, the talk uh, today aims to develop an algorithm uh, that generates a cryptographic key uh, on the fly based on the uh, acoustic properties of the underwater channel. The proposed algorithm is studied in two parts. I will present the first part and George Clivanitis uh, from Florida, Florida Atlantic University will be presenting the second part in the following presentation uh, slot. Uh, let me acknowledge the support of my colleagues, uh, Setskin Gidlerim, uh, Roberto Petrozia, Joao Alves from CMRE, and additionally from uh, Florida Atlantic University, George Livanitis and Dimitris Pados. So the, the working scenario is as follows. There are two legitimate nodes, Alice and Bob, uh, who wish to establish uh, secure communications. A third node, Eve, is a non-legitimate node. Uh, who listens to the signal exchange between Alice and Bob. Uh, the goal is to ensure message confidentiality. 
In other words, we don't want Eve to extract the actual information being sent uh, on the basis, though, of some assumptions about her intelligence. And I will give more details about Eve's in intelligence in the following slides. So uh, message confidentiality, it, it's well known that can be achieved by encryption. Uh, this slide aims to give you a very basic understanding of the encryption process. The process consists of an algorithm and the key. Uh, the original message referred to as plain text is uh, converted via the encryption process into random nonsense referred to as uh, ciphertext. Changing the key changes the ciphertext. Once the ciphertext is produced, it is transmitted into the water. And upon reception, the ciphertext can be transformed back into the original plain text by using the inverse uh, encryption algorithm. And this is important, the same key that was uh, used for encryption. Uh, the, the, secu the, um, the security strength depends on two factors. The, the specific encryption algorithm and the key length associated with it. The algorithm is publicly known, while the key is kept secret in Alice and Bob. Assuming that the ciphertext is known to Eve, uh, recalls she can hear the channel, uh, her basic strategy is to start applying different keys in a brute force manner with the hope to decipher the message. So the key uh, must be long enough to confront brute force attacks by Eve. The security strength is measured by the time it takes for Eve's computer to decrypt the message. And to give you a tangible example, the time it takes for a, su for a supercomputer uh, with a speed of 100 petaflops to decrypt a message of the advanced encryption standard with a key length, uh, with a key of 256 bits uh, length, takes about 10 to the 48 years, which node is much, much longer than the entire age of the universe. So we can claim that the AES-256 is secure under this assumed computational uh, power. Um, why are we doing this research? Uh, the crypto keys are preloaded on Alice and Bob. Typically, we preload a number of keys because each key must be used for a specific time window, depending on the traffic load and the network lifetime. Uh, however, there are two challenges associated with the key management. The first one is how do you share the keys when a new trusted node must join the network and does not have the pre-loaded keys? Second challenge, in the event where one node is hacked, then the entire network is not secure anymore because Eve has access to the current and the future keys. So we tackle these two issues based on physical uh, layer security. And uh, the idea behind PLS is to generate a key between Alice and Bob without the need to share the actual key. And this is possible due to the channel reciprocity in static uh, kite propagation. Yet in practice, reciprocity is hard to achieve. For example, if we aim for kilometers of ranges, and especially when there is uh, platform, uh, platform mobility, then uh, reciprocity is challenged. Uh, consequently, the name of the game shifts towards finding ways to exploit the correlation in the bidirectional link between Alice and Bob. We also assume that Eve cannot be right next to Alice or Bob because she needs to stay uh, covert. So, this slide gives you a, a block diagram of the key generation process. Alice and Bob need to follow four steps. Uh, the first step, Alice and Bob exchange a pre-agreed number of channel probes. Uh, and from these probes, they independently extract some uh, pre-agreed channel features. Second step, the, the features are quantized. And now Alice and Bob have the vector of quantized bits. You can imagine that these quantized bits become the precursor of the key. Third step, the quantized bits of Alice and Bob are not expected to be exactly the same. So in the reconciliation step, there is an exchange of data between Alice and Bob. And the, the final step, we assume that Alice and Bob uh, have reconciled their bits, but also we need to ensure that Eve cannot exploit the information transmitted in the reconciliation step. And at the, at, at the output of the fourth step, we produce the final crypto key. So the focus of my presentation, as the title suggests, 
is on steps one and two, while Josh Clevanitis will elaborate on steps three and four. Uh, as, I, as, I, as I said in the first step, Alice and Bob exchange probes with the intention to estimate the channel, uh, the channel IPARS responses. So for this reason, we use an upsweep LFM as the transmitted channel probe, and the estimated channel response is the match filter output in baseband. Uh, so at this point, Alice and Bob have their impulse responses, and now they compute a set, I call it P, based on the local maxima of their estimated channels. Then they define a subset, uh, sorry, um, um, we are here. This is scrolling uh, by itself, this, uh, uh, oh, scrolling by itself, okay. Okay. All right, uh, so we define a set P and then based, which is based on the local maxima of, uh, 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 of the estimated channels, and then we define a subset of P, which is called, we call it L, and the elements of uh, uh, set L depend on some specific amplitude and delay constraints that we impose at the, at the beginning of the, of the mission. And why we do that? Because we try to get rid of multipath components that reduce the correlation in the bidirectional link. For example, uh, it, the blue dots that you see on this, uh, on this plot uh, this belongs to the set L after we apply some specific amplitude and delay constraints. Now, using the set L, Alice and Bob compute four features. The L0 norm, which is uh, the L0 norm of the, of the set L, which is a measure of standard sparseness. A second measure of standard sparseness, which is a combination of L1 and L2 norms. Uh, a third feature is the L2 norm of the channel, which is a measure of the power loss. And the fourth feature is the channel delay spread. Now, why, why those features? Well, because we believe they are unique to the specific uh, link geometry of Alice and Bob. And any node outside this geometry cannot replicate all these features combined. Let's move to the quantization. So now we have the features, and uh, each feature is quantized based uh, on a link-dependent quantization uh, levels. These levels are a function of the mean and the standard deviation of its estimated feature. And so before applying quantization, we uh, devote a number of probe exchanges, called this number L, to estimate the mean and the standard uh, deviation. Uh, so I will stop here with the description of the algorithm, and I will move on to the, to the data collection now. So the proposed uh, channel features and the quantizer were tested in a real environment. Rep, uh, the REP18 uh, trial happened uh, uh, in the coast of Portugal in September 2018. And from the table in the upper right corner, you can see Alice was a buoy on the 7th, 8th, and 9th of September, while Bob was a wave glider on the 7th and 8th, and a drifting ship on the 9th. From the table also, you can uh, see the depths, the minimum and maximum range, minimum, maximum SNR, and the average link uh, velocity. On the, on the map on the left side, you can see the GPS positions of the three assets in different colors. During these three days, Alice and Bob exchanged uh, 897 LFMs. The LFM uh, signals swept the frequency from 10 to 15 kilohertz band and had one second of duration. Uh, Alice was programmed to transmit the chirp at T0, T0 plus 20 seconds, T0 plus 40 seconds, and so on, while Bob was programmed to transmit the chirp at T0 uh, uh, plus 10 seconds, T0 plus 30 seconds, and so on. Uh, we also took uh, sound speed profiles, and uh, we saw that there was a sur uh, surface layer followed by a thermocline. And the, the average bathymetry there was between 100 and 150 uh, meters. Uh, let's talk about uh, Eve's uh, intelligence. In, in, uh, in our uh, Ocean Seattle 2019 paper, Eve used the hydrophone to eavesdrop. Uh, and of course, the results of that paper uh, were dependent on the absolute position of Eve. Here, we change the game. Eve's position is relevant. Be, and now she is equipped with bellhop. 
So we, we also assume that Eve has knowledge of the 3D positions of Alice and Bob. We also assume that Eve knows the environment, the bathymetry, the sound speed profile, the, the bottom uh, uh, geoacoustic properties. And she runs Bellhop to compute the eigenrays between Alice and Bob. Uh, the Bellhop outcome becomes the input to the ray dependent uh, sound absorption filter computed over the 10 15 kilohertz band. And the output of this operation is the physics based synthetic channel uh, that uh, Eve produces. And let me emphasize at this point that Eve uses the same PLS physical layer security algorithm of the four, the four steps that I, I explained before. Uh, in, the, in, this, in this presentation, the, the, I recall that the first two steps are the same for, Ali, for Alice, Bob, and Eve with the same uh, free parameters uh, involved. Uh, let's, let's say I want to give you a flavor of the, of the estimated uh, uh, channel responses between uh, uh, Alice and Bob and the synthetic channels of Eve. Uh, let's start with the left side in the top left you see the channels from Alice to Bob on the 7th of September. That plot is based on, uh, on the chip processing. Right below, you see Eve simulated channels, having Alice as transmitter and Bob as receiver. Right below, you see the channels from Bob to Alice based on, on the chip processing. And in the bottom uh, left, you observe Eve simulated channels having Bob as transmitter and Alice as receiver. And the same plotting pattern is applied for the 8th and the 9th of September. Uh, in all plots, the horizontal axis is um, represent uh, multipath delay, and the vertical axis represents absolute time. And you can see, you can you can immediately uh, see the correlation in the bidirectional link between Alice and Bob. Eve also does a good job identifying the significant uh, multipath arrivals. Of course, there is a discrepancy uh, between real and synthetic uh, impulse responses, and this is attributed to the fact that uh, the acoustic environment is not perfectly uh, known. But this is a real uh, life limitation that Eve has to cope with, and we need to understand, even with that limitation, if she can find the key or not. Uh, we, had to make a, we had to make a choice. Uh, uh, on how many probes to use to estimate the quantization intervals. Uh, our choice was to use the first uh, 20 probes for estimating the quantization intervals and the subsequent uh, two probes for estimating channel features and applying quantization. This 22 split of the data is called a batch, and each batch produces 56 quantized bits. In total, we generated 43 batches based on uh, 897 chip uh, uh, exchanges. So the figure of merit here is the figure of merit here is the bit disagreement ratio, which is measured at the output of the quantizer. At the end of its batch, we compute the bit disagreement between Alice and Bob, between Alice and Eve, and between Bob and Eve. From the latter two we take the minimum and we declare it as the BDR of Eve. So, results. Uh, on the left side, we plot the BDRs for all the 43 batches, and we see that most of the time, the BDR of Alice and Bob is less than BDR of Eve. Uh, the, dust the dust lines indicate average BDR over the entire data set, over the entire three days. We also uh, want to know for how many consecutive batches the BDR of Alice and Bob is lower than the BDR of Eve. We want to know that before we enter into uh, the reconciliation phase, we need to have a bit vector long enough to confront any brute force attacks. Uh, in the next presentation by George, you will see that the smallest vector size for reconciliation is 168 bits. So we need to have at least four consecutive batches before uh, where the, the BDR of Alice and Bob is less than Eve's. Uh, in th the good news is in this result is that we managed to have five consecutive, consecutive batches uh, uh, where Alice and Bob beat Eve in terms of BDR. And that happened twice in that data set. 
on the right side, you, you can read off uh, uh, the table where we saw the average BDR per feature uh, and the purpose is to show that the proposed features managed to, ex to exploit the, the, the link correlation better than Eve. And I mean, of course, now uh, this is not the end of the story. You wonder whether these results are good enough for Alice and Bob to, to, to independently uh, generate a key um, uh, or not. But uh, in, in George's presentation, you will see that this is actually the case. So to summarize, uh, uh, we discussed how physical layer security can address key management issues in symmetric encryption systems. Uh, we discussed, I pro we proposed four channel features and the, and, and the quantization scheme. Uh, we tested those features based on real data and we managed to show, to show that even with, um, uh, with, despite Eve's intelligence and despite the challenges we had in the channel, we managed to, to beat uh, Eve in terms of BDR. Uh, George will step on these results and analyze reconciliation and privacy amplification in the next uh, presentation. Thank you for your attention and I'm ready to take questions. Okay, thank you very much, Costas. Very nice presentation, well delivered. Are there any questions for the speaker? Hi, Alex. Hi, Alex Hamilton here, um, and for Costas as well. Great presentation. Costas. Hi, Alex. Hi, and um, I'm just wondering with this uh, this approach. Um, obviously, we can need it between two different users. Do you think it can scale to a multi-user environment? Um, so we have two, uh, three or more mm -hmm. nodes. Um, are we relying on yes. pairs of keys, or, or can we have a shared key between them all? Well, well, imagine that you have you imagine that you have already a network where you have a key, a crypto key, uh, associated with it, and then and then uh, the, a new node needs to to uh, to be added to the network. So, so what it can do, it can it can start doing physical layer security, and of course you don't want to share the key of the network with a new node. So what you can do is you can you can start physical layer security between one of the one of the nodes of the network with a new node, and as soon as you as soon as you have the uh, the crypto key established, then you can use that encrypted link to transfer keys back and forth. So and you can have also the new node incorporated into the into the network. So I guess you're suggesting that we might want to share keys through that trusted network once it's set up to share partner keys, for example. You kind of understand correctly what you said. We want to basically we want we don't want to share a key in an unencrypted link. We need to have an encrypted link to share keys, and so the PLS can help you to to establish uh, a secure link, and then you can start start sharing keys in, with uh, from yeah, that. Uh, uh, yeah. Happy. Thanks. Thanks, Austin. For well, the next question, I see Bill Green from the chat. He says that in the US, this type of work could result in hardware being classified. Uh, are there NATO, in brackets, classification issues involved with this work? Not, not for the moment. This, this work is, uh, is completely, is unclassified. Okay, if I may, the only reason I bring it up is I, I have been involved uh, to, to my unhappiness with uh, projects that involved algorithms that became classified. And once those algorithms were in, installed in hardware, uh, the hardware was declared classified and it became extremely difficult to do any further testing with the hardware because of all the classification constraints put on deployment. I just, that's why I bring it up. Well, I mean, this is beyond also my control to tell you what is going to happen uh, with this uh, with this research, uh, Dale. So for the moment, this is uh, unclassified research, and and we, but and uh, the reason being that this also this is preliminary research. It's it's at the infancy of uh, uh, it, we are we are at the beginning. So. Uh, Still don't know the, what is going to happen in the future. I cannot predict that. 
process. Can I just add to that as well that to say that you know we're looking at the segregation of the algorithm versus the uh, you know, classification of hardware as part of the work we're doing in HYC 174. Um, so obviously there's no answer to that right now, uh, and it's a very political question. Um, but there's a lot, some work going on there in IST 174, which you're part of. I, uh, sorry, Alex. I missed. I missed the question. Sorry, because I, you uh, could you please speak up a responding bit. Responding back to Dale's uh, question, saying that you know there's there's ongoing activities in IST one seven four to look at you know do we segregate uh, the actual algorithms from the security classification um, and the purposes that we're looking at there, uh, and that's obviously no answer today per se, but you know something we're talking about in that IST panel. Okay. All right, so I see no other questions, but... Uh, no, there, there are some raised hands, Paulo, Paulo and the, you see oh, some people with raised hands, Roy and Paul. Thanks, Joel. Not sure who was first. Maybe uh, we can go. Yes. Paul? Uh, can you hear me? <laughs> Paul, yes. Yes, so Costas, I'm sorry to say I missed a few parts of your presentation because I have a connection issue while I'm at the office, but... Uh, That's why we have uh, YouTube. Yeah. So do I understand that uh, correctly that Bob and Alice decide on their keys by making use of properties of their channel and Eve is not able to find out exactly what the channel is because she has a different position? <laughs> Not well in this presentation. The position doesn't matter because he, he tries to uh, to simulate the channel between Alice and Bob. So uh, in this in this specific uh, work, we give the we give the knowledge of Alice and Bob positions. And actually, maybe someone can argue that this is too much knowledge. I mean, she needs to estimate the positions of Alice and Bob. But we we gave that knowledge to Alice and Bob. Uh, and uh, we gave to uh, we gave to Eve the positions of uh, the 3D positions of Alice and Bob, and also the bathymetry and whatever uh, acoustic uh, properties of the medium in order to run Bellhop. So the actual position of Eve doesn't matter in this presentation in this work because it is simulating the channel. Okay. So the idea is to the, 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 so the idea is to to say okay, what if Eve has a very good simulator? She can do uh, the link uh, between Alice and Bob. Can she? What can she do with that? Can she? Can she infer the same key? So this is where we're leading to. Thank you, Costas. That was a part that I missed. Okay. Um, an interesting uh, point in that regard is uh, if she did put, uh, put uh, uh, try to measure the channel based on the transmissions. How different would that be from the channel between Alice and Bob? Uh, Roald, if I understand your question, if she, if she had a hydrophone and then she was measuring uh, the, the signals, uh, how different would that be? Yeah. That, that is the question. How uh, different would the channel improve response she measured be? Okay, I mean, that also depends on her position, where Alice, where Alice is, uh, where, where, where Eve is. Uh, we have some preliminary work, uh, and also in the 2019 paper, and uh, in Oceans, and, and 2019 or 18 U, UAM uh, conference, we had Eve using a hydrophone. And in that, uh, in these two papers, we saw that Eve's, uh, of course, everything depends on where uh, Eve is, but we saw lower correlation in Eve's signals uh, than in Alice's and Bob's. So we can, we can say that there are cases where there are, there are uh, positions in, in space where uh, if, the, if Eve is there, then you have, you know, you have a very good, you have an advantage. Uh, I mean, Eve cannot, let's say, do very well. Uh, of course, if Eve is moving very close to Alice and Bob, then, uh, then things will change. Uh, but still, this depends also on the environment. It's not uh, it's not a straightforward uh, answer because theoretically the the environment decorrelates after a few after a few um, wavelengths. You start seeing serious decorrelation of the environment. So it's it's a matter of how close uh, Eve is to the to Alice and Bob. 
I mean, what we are what we are trying to do, and actually as an extension of this work, and uh, hopefully uh, doing a, a paper uh, publication, is to fuse data between uh, uh, between hydrophone data and uh, and bellhop. Try to combine these two things together and see uh, where we are with Eve. Yeah. Since we have one very last question for this presentation, and then we are a bit over time, I would uh, suggest that we have this last question, and uh, then maybe there will be more for the next one. But I would. I mean, George. Yes, exactly. Take, because also George is, is on the same topic. Yes. So no, no. I mean, uh, uh, it was a question for Roy, who has a from Roy, who has a raised hand. So maybe let's take this one, and then we go on. Hi, Costas. Hi, Roy. Hi. Uh, so I guess my question is that uh, so you you are relying on the reciprocity of the channel uh, for uh, exchanging uh, the channel features. Uh, one thing that is of interest in uh, key generation is uh, how stable are the, these features over time. So you can do you know you can extend uh, extend the key by doing extra transmissions. Um, yeah, so the question is on different kind of uh, trials that you did uh, over time, if those features uh, change enough so that you can have a significant uh, different key over time. So let me tell you that uh, so in this in this uh, presentation here, the, the the measurements were taking over three different days. So we're talking about uh, more or less, I would say it's about uh, in terms of time, consecutive time, if I, uh, it's I would say it's more than four hours of uh, of uh, data, even more, uh, I think maybe five hours of data. So obviously, over these five hours, the features change; they don't stay the same. So the the so the, uh, the, here our choice is to to have some features that they are, and that's why we need to also retain the, the quantizer every also, for every so often. It's not like we set the quantization intervals from the beginning and then we let them and we, we, we fix them and we let uh, we let the algorithms, algorithms run for the entire uh, data set. So every, every so often we need to update the quantization intervals because those features are time varying. So that's it. that is the that is the uh, mechanism behind this. So this is how we tackle the time variation. If you see in the paper, the, the quantization intervals depend on the channel itself. Uh, for each feature, we measure the mean and the standard deviation, and this is how we set the quantization intervals for each feature. And this mean and standard deviation is time varying, of course. I don't know if I address your question. Uh, well, I was actually going towards another direction to say that you actually want the features to change because let's say um, let's say you get I don't know how many keys uh, how many bits secure bits you got from from the features, but uh, let's say you got like uh, I don't know twenty or something, and then uh, you may want to extend it. Um, so the way uh, in terrestrial networks they're doing it is by uh, generating another key and another key and another key. Um, so this this can happen if the features I mean, are time-varying. Yeah, well, if I if uh, let me say that in in the, in the next presentation you will see that we don't generate only one key, we generate uh, a bunch of them. So it's not so uh, you for we 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 chop the data into uh, specific segments and for each segment we try to to uh, generate a key. So that. It's not that we generate only one key from the entire data set. Uh, regarding your uh, what you said that you want these uh, features to be time varying, yes, I mean, I mean, I don't, uh, I don't object that. Of course, they are time varying, but the question is how do we? Uh, but the, the and that's why they will not produce the same quantized bits over time. It, the quantized bits will change. I don't know if I, I answered the question. All right, great. Thanks. Thank you. Paolo, over to you. <laughs> and uh, 
Now, I think uh, we should uh, hand over the uh, presentation desk to Georgios. Yeah, thanks, Paolo. Let me share my screen. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we see you. We don't see your screen yet. Uh, I think Costas might need to stop. Okay, I think I'm... You are starting to share. Okay, now we see your window. Yes. Yep, and now should be full screen, right? Yes, okay. Perfect. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Klosters and thanks to the session organizers. Um, this is the follow-up of, uh, of the work that Klosters presented. And uh, uh, as he said, uh, we will be focusing on the reconciliation and privacy amplification states. Um, this is, of course, collaborative work. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, all the colleagues involved, uh, uh, Kostadinos Pelekanakis, Setskin, Ildirim, Roberto Petrocci, and Joao Alves from Neito Siemari and uh, Dimitris Pados from the Center for Connected Autonomy and AI at uh, FAU. So, you see my second slide, right? Perfect. Uh, so, the, the, the problem again uh, was uh, set by Costas so very well, so I will not spend so much time uh, in the motivation and the challenges uh, of uh, physical layer security. Uh, Again, we have Alice and Bob, uh, two underwater nodes that could be mobile, could be static. They are exchanging a bunch of probes. Um, they are extracting features uh, from, uh, from the channel. They are quantizing that features. And then uh, because of location-dependent interference and uh, hardware impairments, uh, the bit streams that they will end up having at the quantization stage, they will be uh, different. I see, Paolo, you lost audio. Are, is everybody, can everybody else hear me? I can hear you well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah yes, we hear you. Yeah, yes, we hear, can you. hear you. Awesome. Um, so the, the objective, of course, at the reconciliation and privacy amplification stage before we generate uh, the key to, to be used for encrypt, encrypting our data, depending on the application, is, uh, of course, to minimize the amount of information that will be leaked to that eavesdropper, right? So, uh, Alison, Bob will need to exchange some data to fix the differences in the two bit streams. And then after they do that, they will uh, amplify uh, the privacy and uh, generate a long key uh, to be used for the application. Uh, as Costa said, we built up on the last two stages, uh, assuming that Alice, Bob, and Eve have already extracted uh, the, the quantized bits from uh, the respective channel features. So what do we do? Our approach for the reconciliation is to use uh, Rich Solomon codes. Rich Solomon codes are very well known for wireless communication, storage, digital TV, and they are very, uh, very good in uh, in correcting burst errors. Right. Uh, the the principle of of the reconciliation protocol that uh, that we're proposing here is to do to do it at one shot. Right. So Alice will send uh, will 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 map the original message, uh, which will be k symbols long, assuming that uh, you you have m uh, bits used per symbol, uh, and uh, will extend that original message into a code word of n symbols long. So it will add some redundancy of uh, two T symbols. This is this is the the, the parity symbols uh, that you add, right? Uh, Alice will then transmit this parity symbols only. Uh, it will not transmit the original message that the quantizer gave us. Uh, and Bob uh, will use that parity bits that received from Alice. Uh, in combination with his own bitstream that he got from his own quantizer, and he will try to correct for uh, the mismatched bits. And Bob will do that only once, and hopefully there are not so many bits mismatched, and we use the proper uh, Rich Solomon code, we will be able to uh, reconcile only in one shot. The second step is to, to amplify the, the privacy of that reconciled message. So both Bob and Alice uh, will use uh, Secure hash algorithm three. Uh, this is a, uh, a cryptographic hash algorithm uh, function that that actually uh, won a competition in East in 2012, uh, and uh, it will use that hash function uh, to get that reconciled me message extended into a random sequence of 256 bits. Uh, so in that case, we we will not have uh, to uh, spend so much so many features. Uh, to, to get keys that are 256 bits long, as Costa said, the, the minimum size of uh, of the bit streams that we will get will be 168. Uh, after successful reconciliation, 
And private simplification, we will get finally uh, keys of 256 bits. So uh, the following graphic uh, shows uh, an overview of how the RS-based reconciliation protocol works. Uh, Alice uh, gets from the quantizer uh, a K symbols long uh, bit stream. It passes it through a read Solomon encoder. At the output, we get that extended N symbols long uh, stream of symbols. Uh, Alice sends only her parity symbols uh, to Bob. Bob then appends these parity bits to her own bit stream that comes from her own quantizer. Uh, then this goes through a read Solomon decoder, and uh, Bob gets an estimate of, of the bit stream that Alice had. Uh, and we, we say here that Bob reconciles to Alice only if that estimate is equal uh, to the bit, uh, the bit stream uh, of Alice. Uh, this is an overview of the algorithm that you can also find in the paper. One practical security constraint that we have here is that uh, this product of M symbols times K minus T, where T is actually the error correcting capability of the Reed Solomon codes, uh, should be greater or equal than native. And this comes actually from, um, the, uh, from AES uh, symmetric encryption uh, work that has been done, and it's considered to be uh, enough for uh, the eavesdropper not to be able uh, to, uh, to to break uh, to break your uh, your uh, your reconciliation. Um, some design considerations here: uh, we consider that Eve can perfectly eavesdrop uh, the parity that Alice sends to Bob, uh, and she can use the exact same Reed Solomon decoder. Uh, however, as I said, due to the uh, constraint that we have set, this will not be sufficient to recover uh, the bitstream uh, of uh, Alice. Uh, the second thing uh, is that this practical constraint, the m times k minus t, is actually the portion of the input uh, that cannot be corrected. So the only way for Eve to predict uh, Alice's uh, bitstream will be to fire a brute force attack to, uh, to m times k minus t, which is obviously computationally hard. Um, both Alice and Bob uh, will then use uh, SHA-3 protocol uh, to practically eliminate uh, any information that the eavesdropper may have about the legitimate key. For uh, SHA-3, we have uh, hash values that can uh, give you uh, output keys of 224, 256, 384, and 512. For this work, uh, we consider 256 keys. And the question here is why, why SHA-3? Uh, this uh, is because if will be unable uh, to find a pair of messages such that the outputs uh, of, uh, uh, of, the, of the hash function will be the same. So even if the eavesdropper has uh, the, almost the same uh, reconciled key, but it's only one bit different than the, and applies the same SHA3 function, you think you will get a completely different key. Um, there are two other properties of SHA3. Uh, one of them says that given the output of the hash, if is unable, uh, to find another input so that uh, y is equal to h uh, of x. And uh, given one message x, Eve is unable to find the second message uh, x prime to satisfy that the outputs uh, of this uh, are the same. We will not spend so much time here, so I'll jump directly to the results. Uh, uh, this is just a quick recap of what Costa showed of the experiment of the rep uh, 18c trial. Alice and Bob are using the uh, rep 18c uh, trial data. Uh, while Eve is using the Bellhop simulated channels, uh, we have 897 probes that were exchanged over three days, and the duration of each probe is, uh, is about 10 seconds. Uh, we are investigating the performance of uh, the Reed Solomon based uh, reconciliation using uh, different combinations of RS codes. So these are uh, some uh, of the parameters here in that, in that table. So uh, we have three different lengths 168, 336, and 364. Uh, this is in bits, uh, and on the left side of the table, you see the bits uh, per symbol. Uh, you also see the parity symbols uh, and the uh, size of the code words, as well as the error correcting capability. And uh, we will use different combinations of channel-based features among the four features that, that Costa showed in the presentation. So, first combination is using Grid Solomon uh, 63,28. Uh, the first, uh, the first argument of, uh, just to remind you, the first argument of the Reed Solomon code is uh, the code word length. The second one is uh, the, uh, the input message length. Um, we uh, have four channel features in this case. Uh, all the four channel features: delay spread channel, sparse channel to normal, and zero norm. Uh, and on the left, on the 
on the top, uh, you see uh, the successful reconciliation. This is a Boolean uh, variable over the uh, uh, batches uh, that were exchanged, the 43 batches. Uh, with blue, you see uh, the reconciliation, uh, the successful reconciliation between Alice and Bob. With red, we saw the successful reconciliation between Alice and Eve. And this is when Eve eavesdrops the channel probes from Bob. And with purple, with pink, sorry, uh, we, you see the successful reconciliation of Bob and Eve. And this is when Eve eavesdrops uh, the probes that are coming from Alice. As you see, uh, the successful reconciliation for Alice, Eve, and Bob, Eve is always uh, zero. Uh, while we have only two cases where uh, Alice and Bob successfully uh, reconciliate. On the bottom, you see the bit disagreement ratio, which is the number of bits that are different between Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice and Eve and Bob and Eve. And uh, the flat lines represent the average bit disagreement ratio over this, uh, these patches. The second combination considered a much uh, stronger um, rich Solomon codes um, with almost double the amount of parity symbols. Uh, so for that reason, we had to concatenate uh, more batches. So we have eight consecutive batches that are concatenated to, to make a message that is 303, uh, 336 bits long. Um, we use only three of the four channel features. And uh, again, uh, the figure shows successful reconciliation on the top versus batch number and p disagreement ratio versus batch number. And as you see here, we have managed to reconciliate successfully uh, Alice and Bob for all, uh, for all, for all the batches, while, Ali, while the eavesdropper has never managed uh, to reconcile. Uh, the third scenario is actually considering uh, a similar code with the one before, uh, with two uh, less bits in, in, in the parity. And uh, we observed that we, we managed to reconciliate uh, only one time. Uh, for, that, for that, we have actually considered using only two features. And uh, the observation here is that due to the mobility and actually the long duration of the, of the probe exchanges, the burstness of the errors uh, were extending beyond the amount of symbols that this particular code uh, was able to, uh, to correct. Uh, so we had uh, two keys that were generated from the first code, uh, the RS 6328, five keys that were generated successfully from the second, and one key that was generated by the third. Uh, we take these keys and we get them through the SHA3 function. And on the left here, you see um, what we call uh, probability values that are generated by uh, running statistical tests from the uh, NIST statistical test suite. So this suite is actually testing the randomness of the generated keys, of these 256 long uh, generated keys. Um, every uh, probability value takes, uh, takes values from 0 to 1. And if uh, that, the output value of the test is actually greater than 0 0.01, we consider the key uh, that the key has successfully passed the randomness test uh, of, of NIST. Um, for our application, we consider that the keys that are passing all the nine tests that you see here on the, on the, on the table uh, will be used for encryption. If one of the keys doesn't pass the test, which is the case for the first, uh, first two keys that were generated by, by, the, by our sort code, then we will discard uh, the key. So to conclude, uh, we, we showed that Alice and Bob reconciled eight times uh, within the, the entire data set. Uh, Eve didn't manage to reconcile, even though she knew uh, the, the parameters of the RST decoder. Um, Eve's knowledge about the uh, privacy amplification uh, protocol doesn't help her gain any uh, better strategy, so she would have to brute forcefully attack uh, the generated key. Uh, different combinations give different uh, numbers of keys, and uh, RS-127 48 was, for this particular study, the strongest. And uh, we have found that six out of the eight keys were valid to encrypt data. Some of the next steps that I think Costas also mentioned was is, also, is to investigate more the authentication protocol between Alice and Bob, uh, explore more features, uh, apart from the four features that, that we used here, for example, the two-way time of flight, and also fuse simulated and, and hydrophon recorded data to, to enhance the intelligence of Eve. I think I'm a bit over time, so I will stop here. Thank you, everybody, and open the floor for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Georgios, for uh, the presentation, also for trying to recover a bit on the time we have. Um, I'm trying to look if there are raised hands. There seems to be none at the moment, so if anyone has questions, please uh, fire. 
Hey, Paolo, I had a question that was put in the chat. So do you want me to just read it out? Well, please, Mandar, sure. Sure, thanks. Right, so uh, thanks for the uh, presentation. It was, uh, it's very interesting work. I had a question about um, Eve's reconstruction. So um, one of the things that you mentioned was if Eve is able to um, get some of the bits right, but even if uh, she had one of the bits wrong, your SHA3 algorithm would make sure that the key she got was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. But your SHA3 algorithm's key is only as strong as the input that went into it. So if she, if the, uh, the seed that you started from was only one bit wrong, Okay, you get a completely different, uh, thing. but nothing stops you from searching for keys with one bit changes in there or two bit changes from there. And that would be a brute force attack that uh, uh, potentially is doable. So how do you prevent that kind of an attack? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, that would that would require essentially you to have some knowledge about the amount of bits uh, that she has managed to uh, correct from the reconciled key, right? Well, not necessarily. She could start with uh, all one bit patterns and all do two bit patterns and all three bit patterns and so on. Uh, uh, so if the, even if she had gotten it wrong um, by a few bits, she might be able to reconstruct. Agreeably, if she had gotten all the bits randomly, it would not be possible because then it would take longer than the age of the universe as you claimed. Right. But it, that would not be the case if she got only a few bits wrong. Right. Right, and uh, that that could be that could be the case, and I, I don't think we account for that for for that at this at this study. Um, certainly, no, but George, no, George, wait, sure. George, wait. Sorry for to jump in. We 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 the input of the I mean we have the quantized vector. The input to the RS uh, to other to 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 the RS uh, code encoder is long enough to account for that because even if you recall i mean i'm looking in uh, there the, the the error correction of of uh, the error correction of uh, the, error, the error correction capability of the encoder is t and k minus t uh, is the number of uh, symbols that she cannot, she cannot correct times m which is basically uh, symbols per bits so basically in uh, I mean, uh, the equation and uh, in the equation one of the paper, we have this practical constraint which says that if uh, we are, we are looking for codes that have uh, m times k minus t greater than eighty, right? So we take that into account in the sense that even if even if uh, the, the, the input the input bit the input string to the RS uh, code word is long enough to account for that, even if uh, even if uh, Eve can partially correct some of the errors, the remaining are big enough in the order of more than 80. So even if you, uh, let's say that the constraint, the, the, the constraint we're putting there is at least more, at least 80 bits will not be able to be recovered by Eve. So that gives you the room to play with. Uh, so that, that gives us, that safeguards this uh, brute force attack. Right, I, I guess, is, does that answer your question, Mander? Well, I mean, if so, the the input the input bit, yeah, the input bit string of the encoder is long enough. Wrong. Yes, uh, then yes, it does. But um, and then, uh, I my question was from the comment that uh, maybe she uh, only gets a few bits wrong. So uh, as long as you have still enough bits to uh, to make it a strong uh, key, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the idea behind it. To have enough enough bits, uh, uh, so that like the the input to the RS encoder to be long enough to avoid this kind of uh, um, this kind of effect. Okay, um, since we are short on time, there is one uh, question from uh, Roy. I see it from the chat at least. Uh, you want me to read it, Roy, or you want to ask it yourself? Uh, no, I can ask. Um, Okay, so I guess uh, it uh, follows the previous discussion. I think that uh, the right approach would be to analyze the number of secret bits you guys have. So if you have like 80 bits, but they're all the same, then the attacker can easily find it, right? Um, so that, that should be from an information theory point of view. We cannot I'm not you. sure I follow your. I'm not sure I follow your reasoning. What do you mean by the, these 80 bits be all the same? I, I'm not sure I follow that. 
So uh, because what actually, you're looking is the output of the SHA3 function, right? No, we, the discussion before was about the key that you start with before you apply the RS. Um, right. so, so that key has to be um, has to be as random as possible. Um, so, so in in cryptography, they would measure it by the number of secret bits, essentially, uh, which is not the number of the key of the bit. But this is not the key that we are using at the end, my uh, Roy. That's not no, the key that we're using. I understand you're using the key after the RS, but uh, considering exactly. again uh, Mander's uh, uh, attack proposal, right? Yes. Uh, yes. You need you needed the beginning at the input to the RS to be very uh, random in a way so that uh, the 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 Eve cannot uh, guess what would be the those uh, those bits at the entrance of the RS. The RS is like an ash, ash function. We cannot hear you, John. I mean, I mean, if if you have a long bit string, even if uh, you this tells you this uh, uh, gives you the um, the let's say it safeguards you from brute force attacks because then Eve needs to start playing games with uh, one bit difference, two bit difference, and so on. So if you have a, a string, as as I meant, as we mentioned, the the input bit string. To the RS encoder, the minimum one is one sixty-eight bits. So she needs no. to start playing brute force attacks on this one sixty-eight bits. Yes, but this is only if this key, which is a big number. This is only if this sixty-four doesn't matter. One thousand bits long uh, key at the, at the entrance of the RS is indeed one thousand secret bits, which means that they are random. Um, so, so this is what you should uh, you should consider. Because if they are, yeah, let's, well, they, let's take uh, mm -hmm. the naive approach and say that these 1,000 bits are all the same, they're just zero. So it would be very easy to, if or if, to... How does Eve, how does Eve know that they're all zero? How does Eve know that Bob and Alice have the, all zeros? This is the idea of uh, when you are kind of this, uh, uh, doing of the cryptography, right? That you are kind of uh, uh, listening to again and again and again and again, and then you can you can uh, see it. But but the, 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 the randomness comes from the channel, Roy. This is, that, this is something that you don't know, that you cannot forecast from, 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 from to begin with. This randomness comes from the channel. The, the randomness of the channel, well, it's, it becomes long. <laughs> Let's take it offline, I don't know. You just, uh, sorry. <laughs> sure. Okay. <laughs> okay. What was that? Uh, I started talking about you talk first. <laughs> oh, no, no, okay, okay. So, no, I would, I would just like to close the, the discussion of the second paper. I know that this is becoming hot, so it's possibly time to proceed to the last uh, um, paper of the session. So thanks again, Georgios uh, and Costas and co-authors for the two presentations. So I hand over to Rod for the last paper. Yes. So now we'll introduce uh, Roy again to present uh, the paper on secret heap generation, but topology based. So go ahead, Rod. Okay. So can you see my screen? It's all okay? Yes. Great. So hello everyone, uh, I'm Roy from the University of Haifa and uh, this uh, work uh, is a collaboration uh, with uh, Paolo Kazari and his student Davide and with uh, Stefano Tomasin who's from uh, Padova University and his uh, student uh, Francesco. And uh, we are also uh, considering the case of secret uh, key generation, but we are taking a slightly different approach and as a source of randomness, uh, we will use the, the, the topology of the network and essentially the delay in the routes. Um, so I'm going to kind of uh, skip that because uh, it was already discussed by uh, by uh, Costas at the beginning. Um, I'm just going to say that this uh, uh, this uh, uh, work is is part of a, of a bigger project that we have that is funded by a NATO Science for Peace grant. Um, and there we are kind of considering a, a bigger framework of also a message authentication, a interception of signal, low probability of detection, and also a prototyping. Um, okay. So uh, let's start with the system model. We have Alice and Bob. They are looking for to make a secure communication session, and then Eve is trying to tap in. Uh, the assumption to all, including uh, Eve and uh, Alice and Bob, uh, is that the network topology is unknown. Uh, they also don't know the number of the key, of the nodes. 
and the node's location is also uh, unknown, uh, but can maybe uh, be, be uh, estimated if you have some sort of a direct link to a node. Uh, then there, we, we assume that there is no preliminary secret key or function by Alice and Bob, so there, there can be hash function, but they are public. Um, and then if you're doing a key generation, there are two ways. One is federated, uh, which means that uh, you make a key and then you share it to reach some sort of an agreement. Um, and then there is non-federated, whereas uh, Alice and B both separately are generating a key and they don't share it. Okay. So we are taking the, the later approach. Um, and there are different kinds of sources of randomness uh, to generate the key. Uh, essentially, what you need is to find a random source. Uh, you share it between Alice and Bob somehow, but but not with Eve. And the options are are uh, very uh, uh, open if you consider uh, underwater acoustic communication. Uh, you can look at the frequency response. Uh, you can look at the received uh, signal strength, uh, delay spread sparseness as Costas uh, presented, uh, Doppler shift, and uh, also the waveform itself can be a source of random. Uh, and we suggest to use as, as a source of random the propagation delay and the network topology. Um, so why, why choosing that? Um, well, what we are looking for as a key is to have some sort of spatial dependency so that if Eve is uh, away, not close to uh, Alice and Bob, um, then uh, the delay in the, in the link would be different. And then we also want that propagation, that that uh, source of randomness to be slowly time dependent, okay? Because we want to uh, we want to uh, uh, again generate the code between them, but we also want large value variability so that we can make a, a large uh, a long key. Um, and, and we do want the the time dependency uh, because uh, that will allow us to generate keys all over again if we wait enough time. Okay, so this is uh, this is essentially the methodology. So we're gonna go over it uh, just slowly. Uh, we start with Alice, uh, and Alice is uh, broadcasting uh, what we call an ARPing. Um, if it's a network, it will be like an RTS uh, message. Uh, that contains the ID uh, of uh, Alice, uh, just some sort of a random ID. And then uh, a delay number, which is uh, initiated to be zero. Then any relays on the way, uh, it basically then broadcast and, and there is a flooding mechanism. And any relay on the, on the way uh, would add its uh, temporary ID uh, to, the, to this route. And to the uh, delay parameter, it will accumulate or add uh, its hardware delay. So uh, assume that you have, uh, imagine that you have uh, uh, receive the message, then you need to decode it, then you need to encode another one, then you need to transmit it. So there's a, a, maybe a, a known a preliminary known delay, hardware delay in that process, so you add that to the packet. Uh, what happens next is that uh, Bob obtains all those uh, ARPing messages from all over the, the network, wherever he gets it, and then computes the propagation delay for different routes um, that he gets it. He, he knows the route because uh, he has the temporary ID on the, on its way. Then uh, using a, a known hash function, a public hash function, it would choose the routes uh, that are preferred. Uh, these routes would be those that show the most variability of the nodes. Um, and then would extract the key uh, from the delay uh, by quantizing the delay. Um, the, this process uh, basically repeats itself by uh, Bob broadcasting a, a reply message, like a clear to send or LTS or something, and the same process all over again until uh, Alice receives the, all those uh, RREP messages and, and choose the same key. Um, hopefully, um, the delays would the routes would be would be the same on the symmetric on on the return message and also the. Uh, uh, the um, propagation delay in the routes would not change much, okay, relative to the quantization we are taking. Um, what Eve is doing is he, uh, she collects all the messages she hears on the way, all the RF and the R pings, and then she obtains the uh, routes information and can estimate the delay and reconstruct the key. 
for that, uh, she may choose uh, graph localization approaches, um, for example, the multidimensional scaling or any other that is on the way to uh, fill in holes in the topology, okay? Because um, if the topology is sparse, it may not be connected to all the nodes. So, uh, and then essentially uh, by combining the RF and the RPing, she is able to uh, uh, to kind of uh, see the entire link um, and try to reconstruct the key. So that's the that's the idea. Uh, there is an analysis that we did for a secret B analysis. Uh, essentially, uh, in terms of secrecy, we would uh, define it as the mutual information uh, between the keys uh, that you get and Eve's information. And if we repeat that, this key information a uh, number of time that goes to infinity, this K over here, uh, this mutual information would go to zero. So that means that uh, our approach is secret. Uh, then we can define uh, something that is called the weak secrecy capacity. And that is the number, essentially it's the number of secret bits if we consider K to be equal to one. And that weak secrecy capacity, we can actually bound it uh, between those uh, two uh, um, uh, expressions over here. Uh, whereas X, X here is the delay from the Alping, Y is the delay from the R rep. Okay, so the information that Alice and, and Bob are obtaining. And Z is the information uh, that Eve is obtaining. Um, then, um, uh, and then this information Z is, as, as I mentioned before, is by reconstructing the delays doing the MDS or, or whatever. Um, then we can actually show that uh, this corresponds um, to a, a measure of a differential entropy uh, minus the delay resolution. Uh, this row is the delay resolution that we quantize the, the, the delay that uh, is get, that we are getting. So this is a way for us to evaluate how, how much secret bits we can, uh, we can uh, achieve uh, by doing this uh, game. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show some experimental uh, results that we got for this approach. Um, we implemented the, the algorithm that I showed on uh, seven uh, Evologix modems. Um, and uh, we did communication between uh, Alice and Bob. So Alice transmitted the Alping and Bob responded with the RF. And they relay on the way forward that the messages accumulated the hardware delay. So all that was essentially uh, implemented in real time. And then what Eve was doing is the tracks, uh, she tracks the Alping and the RF messages and then obtained the topology by this MDS, corrected the arrival times, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, this experiment was done in the Caldo Nazo Lake. I was able to trans to express it nicely. Uh, so this is a lake close to Trento. Um, and you can see here three topologies. Uh, the first topology was repeated once, the second one uh, twice, and the third one three times. While uh, the boats on the way, there were three boats, and there were two, uh, and there were, uh, two uh, nodes on the pier. Uh, were allowed to drift because the boats were allowed to drift. Uh, so, uh, so we created some motion and uh, uh, essentially some change in the propagation delay. Uh, these are the results for k equal one. So, uh, just one uh, message exchange. Um, on the left hand side, I will show the hammering distance sum over the seven trials, and uh, on the x-axis, I show the resolution in seconds. So this row that I mentioned before, the quantized uh, parameter. Um, so essentially it's in seconds, meaning if we have uh, 10 milliseconds, it means that is the resolution that we believe that uh, uh, we can get the right uh, propagation delay, considering multipath and, and all the other stuff. Um, so uh, on the blue, we have Alice and Bob. So what is the difference in terms of bits between them? for, uh, as I mentioned, summed over the seven trials. And red is what Alice uh, achieved uh, as, as a minimum, okay? So the best result that Alice achieved by changing the identity of Alice, of uh, Eve. We were able to do that offline to change the, the identity between four different positions. And then in uh, yellow, we have uh, what is the worst position of, of Eve. Um, so we can see a considerable distance. And then on the right hand side, we show the same approach, same thing, but here we actually uh, had the delay fixed on uh, 40 milliseconds. 
um, and uh, we show the results as a function of the trial number, the different kind of trials. Um, so essentially we conclude that there were a good agreement, uh, some, some errors, but, uh, but not too many because the, if, we, if you look at the summed over the seven trials. Uh, this is also interesting. This is the humming distance that we get from the different trials. Um, so the first number, let's say here five over here, would be what, what is the difference in terms of bits, uh, the humming distance, uh, between the key that was obtained by Alice in trial, uh, between trial one and trial two. Okay, so that means that we can regenerate again and again uh, different kind of keys. Uh, if we consider different uh, topology, or of, or if we let it, uh, if we let the, the nodes drift, essentially, um, so we we observe the significant differences in the keys, um, and that is that is essentially the work. Uh, we are actually going to do a very cool uh, inter, uh, application of this work uh, in the in January. There's going to be uh, the first Israeli astronaut to the space station, um, so he's going to. Uh, actually communicate with uh, one of my AUVs <laughs> by uh, doing this relay of different kind of communication satellite to the ICC control center from their VPN to the University of Haifa, RF communication to a buoy, and from there with underwater acoustic communication. So of course, all the links over there has to be secured. And this is uh, the secured way we proposed for the acoustic uh, link. Uh, and that's it, uh, open to any questions. Thank you. Uh, so there are not any questions to this presentation in the chat yet. You see, are there any hands? May, may, may I start? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, Roy, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, what I want to understand is at the end, so how many secret bits did you did you get? from this, uh, from this uh, uh, process. Okay, so, so um, what, we, what we did for, sim this, is some, this is a statistical analysis, of course, and you need a lot, mm -hmm. of, uh, a lot of simulations. So we actually implemented the code and ran it over 20 million uh, uh, realizations. Um, and that gives us a number, that, that gives us CS uh, to be bound between a, uh, 3.3 and 3.8 bits. So uh, coming back to our first discussion, the initial uh, key uh, length was much higher. It was like 40 bits. And then we got the number of sequence bits to be much lower. Still okay if you consider that you can uh, uh, redo uh, the transmissions, you can do the, the key generation, and every time you have sufficient differences between the keys that you are getting, um, so you can basically accumulate and get, let's say, four, three point five. Yeah, go ahead. So no, what I'm trying to where I'm trying to get to is okay. At the end of the day, you do all, you do all these things. At the end of the day, you end up with a key, right? We, yes. You end up with a key that you want to use. Is that is, is is that correct? Okay. Yes. So that in that regard, what is the, the key length that you are ending up is what? The key length that we is, got is, about is in the order of forty bits. But this is not the so right I, question. I, I'm, I, I'm missing you. Uh, Forty bits. But, but, okay. And how do you how do you how do you intend to use these forty bits? I am not. What I in I'm, the sense that at, at, the, at, at the end of the day you wanna have an algorithm, like basically an encryption algorithm that will take these forty bits and do and, and do something, right? Ah, sure. Then while once you have the key. You do the same thing as you did in the previous presentation. You have some sort of a hash, fun hash function, let's say an RS, or there are multiple of them. Um, and then you use that to generate your big one. Okay. So the input is 40 bits then to the hash function, but do you think that this is uh, good enough for a brute force attack? Maybe, I mean, do you, you know how long, how, how long it takes for if to have a brute force on 40 bits? So, so that's what I'm trying to imply that the number of of bits is actually not three, uh, 40 bits. It's actually 3.5. Uh, 
because you have to consider what is the number of secret bits, not is the number of bits. Yeah, yeah, the secret. I mean, what what is? I mean, at the end of the day, but okay, but if it knows the input to the hash function, like the length of the hash function, or not? Yeah, yeah, everything is public. So if knows, for example, that the input to the hash function is 40 bits, she knows that. She doesn't know the bit, but she knows it's 40, no? Yes. So she can apply a brute force on this, no? Sure, but it's actually easier for her. She doesn't have to do it for 40 bits because the number of secret bits is much lower. That's why so you even need to worse. regenerate and regenerate the... Yes, of course. That's why you need to regenerate and regenerate the uh, the keys all over again until you have a sufficient number of secret bits, not bits that that you can. Okay. Can so, for, and then for how long do you need to do that? Well, it depends on you. When are you satisfied? Sorry. It depends on the user. If you are satisfied with I don't know 100 bits, secret bits, then you know that's it. If you're satisfied with less, you do it less. I mean, I mean, there are there are uh, encryptions that you know they have uh, specific uh, constraints. You cannot use any number of bits. They 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 need to have so many bits in order to comply with some security security constraints. But I I I get your um, I get your point. Depends on what's your application. I mean, the, then you will. I mean, you need to rerun and rerun until you get to the bits that you need. Then in order to uh, apply then an encryption algorithm. Yes, so that's why it's important to show that the key is actually changing over time. Um, I have a question or comment. Uh, we're going to use the achieve the routes with the flooding approach to get the shared secret or shared randomness. But uh, how can you know that you get the same routes both directions? That would uh, depend on local. Uh, noise levels and uh, if there maybe are some collisions that makes some transition not go through and so on. Sure, so so uh, this is this is why we actually uh, uh, considered to show it in a real experiment where you have all those stuff. So there were a lot, there was an ARQ, ARQ mechanism that was implemented and um, all these stuff are, are keep happening, but you um, what is important is that as essentially once the packet actually uh, passes through the hardware delay, the accumulated hardware delay is uh, is uh, is attached. So you can uh, essentially uh, uh, recover for this kind of uh, of uh, packet loss. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Roy, one last uh, one last thing. If you assume that, uh, do you make an assumption on if uh, if she knows any of the positions of the nodes, or what if he knows partially all the nodes where they are? Because she over she, op she overhears the CTS RTS, so more or less she may have the capability to build her own uh, route uh, map. If that is the case, then uh, she can. Uh, so this gives you an advantage in in terms of the uh, propagation delay of the of the signals. Yes, is that so correct? The, in that case, the, in that case, what do you what do you plan to do? The, the method works by uh, it has some limitations. So we assume that no one knows the topology. There is no no one knows the topology. No no one even knows the number of nodes. So even if you heard a few R rep and the R ping because the ID of the nodes is temporarily, Eve would not be able to know how many nodes are there. And also Alice and Bob doesn't know. They just hear whatever they hear. So it's a bit hard to reconstruct the topology again and again. But if Eve is able to reconstruct and, and it does happen from, from time to time, uh, then that's it, the, the key is compromised. Thank you. Uh, we are way ahead of the so I... I think we should stop it here. I want to thank uh, all the presenters of these sessions for interesting talks and interesting discussions here also. And then I leave the floor back to Hao.
Roel, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Roel. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you, uh, Roy, George, and, uh, and Costas for this last session. So I, I guess this concludes the technical program of our conference. Uh, I, I sincerely hope this uh, has been uh, a valuable use of your time. Uh, from our side, I can guarantee that uh, this was for sure the focus of all our efforts, make sure that the conditions were there for this to be a valuable usage of your time. Uh, from now, we will proceed uh, with setting up a, a special issue. So I, uh, I had initial interactions with Mandar for, the, for the, how, how we should proceed on that. I'll, you'll hear from me on, 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 on that side of, of, of things on the special issue for the Journal of Oceanic Engineering. Uh, it's also our intention to uh, uh, hold a conventional UCOMS next year. Uh, so uh, you will likely see a call for papers coming your way before the end of the year. Um, uh, especially knowing that next edition of UCOMS, one of the reasons we want to hold it next year in face-to-face -face is because it will be the 10th anniversary edition of UCOMS that had its first uh, edition in uh, 2012. Uh, but before saying goodbye, I would uh, just like to offer the floor very quickly. I know that you, uh, you've had a long day had here long with day. us, but very quickly, I'd like to offer the floor uh, to the, uh, to the uh, Vice President for President Conferences and Symposia of the IEEE Oceanic Engineering Society. Some of you know him, with us at San Marie and everybody recently, so over to you, Fausto. Thank you. I won't take much of your time. I don't want to bother anyone. Just to say that it was a pleasure to uh, join and follow the event from far. Although it was not the same as in Villa Marigla, we all know that. We hope that next year, for the 10 years, we'll be able to be all together. And I'd like to acknowledge and thank Joao and all the team at CIMARI that made this possible. It was a huge work. Uh, I know that. Um, as always, uh, UCOMS had a very high-level program, and I'm glad to see that even online, the number of participants was always much higher than the number of papers for a single track conference, and that's a very good sign. I hope that now we'll have a special issue with the, the best of this research and see you all next year in uh, Villa Marigla in Lerici. I hope I didn't take too much of your time. No, it was fine. It was uh, the right. second uh, uh, a word from our sponsor from our moment of you comes for the day. So thank you very much for thank that, uh, Fausto. Uh, so yeah. I think so this I think is a wrap up. Uh, unless someone wants to uh, uh, ask something else, I guess for now we're good. I, I really would like to thank you again, your presence, uh, your contributions, your involvement, and uh, for sticking with us here. I hope we can also count on you for the next edition of UCOMS that we hope uh, it will be uh, back to normality here in, uh, in Lerici, in the beautiful Villa Marigula. Uh, and this would be for those that have been uh, in the UCOMS. This is uh, would be the, the the time of the day where we would uh, project the map location for the social dinner uh, restaurant. So we can only uh, we can only think of that for next year. So thank you very much again. Uh, thanks for sticking with us. Till next time. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye everyone. Bye. Bye, guys. Very good work on tonight. Good this. Tonight. You're too kind, Paolo. That's true. There was no cat that appeared in the presentations. Ciao, Paolo. Ciao. Bye, yes, bye, everyone. Was, uh, was it? <laughs> Bye, everyone.